Institute for Development Studies. We're happy to have you here with us for the public seminar on education and human capital development in the Philippines. To formally begin our activity, may I call on our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for her opening remarks. Hi. Good afternoon to everyone, to our colleagues from the government, uh, representatives from the academe, civil society, and the private sector. This month, our schools opened their doors to over 27 million students uh, for the school year 2019-2020, making this afternoon's public seminar very timely and relevant. We are featuring three PIDS studies on education and human capital, particularly on the K-12 program and out-of-school children. As you all know, we welcomed the first batch of senior high school graduates under the K-12 program last year. Uh, there were over 1.2 million of them. News reports said that this figure exceeded the expectations of the Department of Education in terms of enrollment in and completion of the program. But what happens after that? Have the students been equipped with the needed skills to enter college or the workforce? Moreover, what do our recent graduates and employers think of the program? This afternoon, we will know about the experiences of senior high school graduates and employers as well as their thoughts on what could be improved in the program. Our very own senior research fellow, Dr. Aniceto Orbeta, will shed more light on this later. Another important topic is the issue on the out-of-school children. Our senior research fellow, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, will provide an overview of the current status of the out-of-school children in the Philippines. More importantly, he will talk about the reasons why these children are out of school as well as what makes them at risk of dropping out of school. We also provide some policy recommendations to reduce the out-of-school children in the country. On a related study, PIDS research fellow Dr. Michael Abrigo will talk about the so-called demographic dividend. The study simulates how the interaction between public policy and population aging may affect household welfare and fiscal balance in the foreseeable future using the new National Transfer Account Time Series estimates for the Philippines. It also shows how investments in education and appropriate labor policies can help the country re reap the benefits of demographic transition. I hope that this afternoon's seminar will serve as a venue to discuss strategies and opportunities on how we can improve our education system. We look forward to hearing your insights. Again, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reyes. Our, our first presenter is a senior research fellow here at PIDS. He has a PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines and a postdoctoral degree from the Harvard University. He is a professorial lecturer at the UP School of Economics. He is an economist is specializing in education and labor market issues, applied economic modeling, impact evaluation, social sector issues, demographic economics and information and, infor and communication technologies. He has developed various economic, demographic and empirical household decision models on schooling, labor supply, health and nutrition and savings. He served as a consultant to the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, a Australian Agency for International Development, International Labor Organization and Millennium Challenge Corporation. He also served as a principal Principal Investigator at the Innovations for Poverty Action. Friends, I give you Dr. Aniceta Orbeta. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what I'm presenting today is a, uh, a first of a series of studies that we have been doing on uh, senior high school, and, and this actually came from this paper, and we tried to catch the uh, first batch of senior high school before they left school uh, last year. Um, and uh, last year. So, the, so this is the uh, 
uh, study that uh, asked both the senior high school about to graduate and uh, firms who are supposed to be hiring them. The, this is a study requested by the PIDS board and uh, see focuses on the uh, employment prospects uh, issue. Remember that the, the, pro the program, one of the selling points that was used to uh, sell the program is, is that uh, it, once you finish senior high school, you can be employable. So that's the basic question that we tried to answer. So I'll, uh, so this is this uh, structure of the report. So we talk about the FGD results of the students. Of course, we provide you a background of, uh, I think the Dr. Reyes already mentioned the number of students that we have. And uh, the key informant interviews with firms. Basically, these are the, the uh, human resource officers of the firms that we, and what, are, what we found as, as, as for, uh, Highlighting of uh, the findings and recommendations. Okay, so we know that uh, senior high school is part of the uh, what's what people call K to 12 law, which is R810533, uh, which has several components. Based, I think my, uh, some of the previous policymakers described this law as the uh, compendium of all uh, desired reforms for the education sector in one law. So you have uh, you have. Ma uh, ECD there, you have mother tongue there, you have uh, senior high school, of course, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So there are many components and uh, of this law. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, it's almost like uh, trying to do everything all at once in one law. Okay, so the, what we uh, look at is because of the short study that we did uh, was uh, Look at the curriculum and, 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 and on what are supposedly in how this translates to competencies, and we identify job types of jobs that high school graduates uh, fit high school graduates, and uh, what's the perspective of the private sector about high school senior high school graduates, and provide some policy recommendations moving forward, essentially. So this is the curriculum of the senior high school. So you once see, see the last row uh, tries to summarize the whole basic education curriculum, elementary, junior high school, of course, the senior high school uh, itself has uh, eight uh, core learning areas, and you have tracks, uh, four tracks, actually, in the you know, academic, consisting of uh, general academic, uh, and uh, STEM, ABM, UMS, and all, and all that. Then you have technical vocational education group into five, but actually there are about 100 uh, specializations in TVL, you have sports and arts and design. And of course, uh, underlying all of that is the uh, work immersion, uh, or sometimes called combinating activity or research for, for whatever is your uh, track. Okay, so this is the statistics of the, uh, of the 2017-2018 batch. So you know, Dr. Reyes already mentioned 1.2 million in grade 12. Uh, so that's about, uh, I think the department was only expecting uh, was 1 million. So we have 200 persons. So that's why it's, it's, uh, there was a, uh, uh, understating of what, what, what the number of students will be. Uh, by about 200,000 and then uh, this is the uh, configuration of the school so you have 52 percent are, are deep ed schools uh, about 40 percent are 45 are, uh, percent uh, are, are in uh, private schools and three percent in ECCs and LUCs so you have about 11,000 schools offering uh, uh, senior high school so this is the distribution across the region, so it's basically reflective of the population, so the larger the population, uh, the largest, so the 4A is the biggest one. But one thing that you should realize is that it's dominated by female. Uh, you, uh, if you have been an observant of the education sector, the higher you go in up the ladder, the more female dominated is the school. So that starts uh, even in junior high school. So in senior high school, is getting more pronounced and pronounced as you go up the education ladder. So the senior high school is reflective of that fact. In terms of uh, model, uh, 
strand offerings, uh, you will see here that there are supposedly eight strands if you count the four and four in Akkad, four in TVL, and plus or, uh, uh, not four, but whatever. But uh, what the schools we have found is that the modal class would be only one strand uh, for uh, public and private, and uh, the for the pri uh, issues and LUCs, you have two. So I think. Uh, this uh, reflects the capacity to offer more than the demand of the students. I would suppose the students will have very varied demand, except that the school may not be able to offer. So there are uh, most like, uh, I mean, 43% 40, 40, public offering only one, and for a private, it's also about the same. Uh, so that's the, that's the structure of, of, the, uh, of the offerings of the uh, strands and uh, in terms of uh, uh, by specific strands you have gas and TVL as the most uh, popular among uh, for for uh, public in uh, gas and uh, ABM for private for issues and LUC you have uh, about sprinkling of TVL humes and stem uh, essentially so that's the the way you can look at uh, figure, try to figure out what's the offering of the schools. And uh, distribution by sex, as I said, the, the, you'll see here that uh, ACAD is dominated by female and TVL is dominated by male. And of course, uh, uh, arts is also dominated by, by a little bit by female and sports by male. So that's the, the uh, stylized facts about uh, distribution by sex. Uh, in, uh, in the, in the uh, academic strands, uh, this is the distribution. So uh, gas is female dominated, ABM is female dominated, STEM is male dominated, uh, and uh, UMS is female dominated, and maritime, of course, is, is male dominated. So that, that's the uh, the number may be 1.2 1, 1 million private high schools and about 600,000 receiving vouchers. This is the uh, uh, graduation rate, about 96%. As of this is the data as of June uh, when we started writing this report, 96% uh, and uh, this is by, by track. So it's very high uh, uh, graduation rates. Okay, so let me now try to describe to you what the students told us when we talked to them. So the, the, there were 18 schools and we did about 27 FGDs. Uh, we tried to separate the ACAD from the TVL track students. Uh, and uh, I talked to them separately. So you have 18 schools of 27 all in all. Not all the schools that we visited have both tracks. So that we, it should have been 36, but we found out that, not, that, that they have uh, some of the uh, schools did not offer uh, the TVL trucks. And we talked to 26 uh, uh, human resource officers of firms, uh, which we'll describe uh, a little bit. So the discussion points for the students are one is selection of schools and trucks and the strands and experience with senior high schools, their prospect of finding employment or being employed after senior high school, and the prospects of going to college uh, after senior high school. So in selection of truck, uh, the major things that are mentioned by the students is convenience, affordability, free, tu uh, the free tuition in public schools, of course, vouchers, this is the other thing. And uh, continuity of the secondary education in the same school. So basically, if they have the, where they got their junior high school, they, they continued on for uh, em influence of family and peers and, and perceived uh, reputation of the schools, the other one. So that, that's for selection of the schools. For selection of the tracks is basically determined by personal preferences of interests of the students, the, or so-called interests of the students. Uh, so, uh, for instance, if they want uh, science and pursue in science and engineering, they would go to STEM. And if you want BS education, you go to UMS and BS business management, you go to ABM. And gas for generally undecided students and uh, um, a little bit of prospects of employment as, as the uh, for the careers that they have uh, chosen. 
So you had uh, the other thing that they mentioned is the advice of their parents, uh, their uh, siblings, and peers or friends, and uh, the availability of the truck strand in the chosen school. Sometimes, uh, it's because uh, convenience is a very important factor, they just force to good into taking whatever strand is in the school that they finally decided to enroll in. So that's basically the, other, the thing that uh, uh, we noticed is that the the senior high school orientation and the INCAI uh, give them some direction, but it's not, uh, it's a very low uh, kind of influence uh, that, uh, that the students are, not, are, are use, using. So both of those are basically, so the per track is basically a personal choice rather than whatever provided by the INCAI or whatever the orientation they got. So the experience in senior high school, the subjects enjoyed largely depend on the teacher effectiveness. So we, we have found out that this is the first uh, batch of students. So it, their enjoyment about the classes depends upon how they teach uh, the performance of the teachers, very teacher dependent. And other reasons, of course, their interest uh, uh, and really bust the track. So th this is, I think, the first experience of students being tracked into certain uh, fields. Uh, they have to choose. So uh, the uh, uh, that that also created a lot of issues uh, in terms of their education, for instance. So the <coughs> this is the first uh, year implementation, and the other thing that we, they have mentioned uh, uh, unanimously, they always mention research is a very difficult. Uh, I don't know why uh, most of they don't like research. It's difficult to them. I, I don't uh, uh, because perhaps of the, re of the requirements, but that has always been mentioned by the students. You know, like. So the, they tend to enjoy an excellent subjects related to the speci specialization. That means they like uh, subjects that are aligned with their specialization in the track. So which is a uh, double-edged sword, actually, from my perspective. Uh, the, uh, the varied opinions about the relevance of subjects and the curriculum, the uh, uh, Subs, the subjects, like for example, the subject outside the specialization should be taken in junior high school. They don't want generals in senior high school. So basically, this taking the students are taking the extreme of tracking, uh, which is uh, surprise, uh, which is perhaps a first blush reaction that they are being tracked into certain fields. But uh, uh, it's you will know uh, later. I will mention that most of them or actually 75 percent of them, both for ACAD and TVL, wants to go to college. So this kind of, uh, of not giving attention to core courses is, is, is worrying for me, at least for some person who's studying uh, education. Some believe that all the subjects contributed to the pre preparation in college. So that's the uh, generic uh, comments that we get. Uh, the subjects that would be useful for them are, are, are in, uh, sub in real life and college and employment, basically those are the, and, and uh, those he that help them are, uh, develop social skills are very important for them as well. Overall, the, this is the, what we can gather from most of the comments. The, it helped them perhaps the, the, the additional two years help them firm up their decisions on what to pursue in life. That's what, uh, that's a common, uh, comments of the students. So the, that's the one of the uh, positive side of uh, additional two years of education. And uh, it also helped them uh, develop many soft skills like people skills, communications, because they're asked to work together s much more as a group. Uh, communications, critical thinking, and positive, at positive attitude, teamwork, and work ethic because of the work immersion program. So those, this, these are the things that the are the positive uh, influences of the additional two years. So uh, help them decide on what pursue to, uh, what career to pursue, and at the same time prepare them for not just the academic, but many other things that they will be needing in life, for instance, working with others and all of that. So the challenges at the, uh, that they found is this, uh, this is uh, perhaps a, uh, a burning pain of the program, is the lack of required facilities, especially for TVL students, textbooks, materials, demonstration. Uh, 
um, there's for demonstration purposes, dissatisfaction with class and uh, curriculum management, combining class sections, uh, TBL and academic tracks, offering subjects in grade 12 instead of grade 11, offering both research one and two in the same semester, for instance. So there's, there's a, a lot of uh, confusion, uh, which is a, it should be normal for a new program, for instance, uh, confusion in the field. Teachers sometimes handle subjects that are not related to the specialization, perhaps because the subject is required, there's no teacher, so somebody who is brave enough to teach the course is drafted to teach the course. Uh, too many subjects, this is one thing that the, there are too many subjects and other tasks uh, which compromise the quality of teaching as well and, and, and learning uh, outcomes of the students. So that, that's the, the, that's the uh, opinion of the students. Having standardized some, some, even if teachers cover different, cover content uh, or topics. I mean, uh, I don't know how to take that, but that's what the, what the students are saying. post space for enrollment, in general, students are not entirely confident about their employability. So they feel they don't, uh, they're not uh, prepared. So employ employment opportunity for senior high school graduates might be limited at the entry level positions, of course, and support staff and service oriented jobs. Firms will still prefer college graduates. They know that the, the firms prepare college degree holder, older and few years of experience something that they can get employed depending on the available jobs in the vicinity. Many TBL students from public schools appear to have relatively confident because of the NC uh, they have taken and passed. But the thing is, not all TBL students were able to take the NC. They find out that the NC, you know, some, many of the students were able to take the NC because the school prepared that the students will take the NC. And some of the students cannot pay for the fee. So that, that's the other thing that uh, that's, that's, if the school did not prepare, uh, did not arrange that the students will take the NC, then the students will not take, will not be able to take the NC. So basically that's, that's the common, uh, they were able to take the NC because the school arranged uh, uh, schedule for the students to take the NC. Uh, so whether they have money to pay for the fee or not is just another question. Okay. Uh, uh, jobs perceived are more common available, basically bakery, worker, barista, carpenter, whatever uh, the basic uh, one job they mentioned is paid better, most call certain agents, some of them are considered best call center agents. Some mentioned a specific jobs related to strands took up while some mentioned interest in putting up a small business. So there's, there's the, uh, the employment uh, objective of the program has both employment as well as uh, as an entrepreneurship, so basically that's a dual objective of the program, uh, exit of the program, uh, this one of uh, the four exits of the program. Most uh, believe that employers look at educational qualification, technical skills, soft skills, and uh, uh, basically communications, uh, computer literacy, and attitude. And students expect to receive the minimum wage, I mean, uh, commensurate to the qualification. Uh, actual work experience, some uh, started working while in grade 11. So it, uh, I think these are the guys who have INCs and they want to work. Most of the jobs are fast, fast food crew and uh, uh, especially they consider space as a, as a work rather than uh, uh, help them to go to complete their education. Uh, a majority of imply that their reservation weights are infinity because uh, most, uh, as I've said, 75% of the students we, we interviewed, whether uh, academic or TVL, are going to college. They are not working. So if ever somebody decides to work, it's, because it's a temporary thing. They, they always say that if we can't enroll in college right away, we work. But our desire is, at least 75 of them saying that. Uh, so it's not, it's, it's one thing that we, we notice is that it's not different between academic students and TVL students. 75%, both of them, about 75% says that they were pursuing college. That's the data that we get from them. Okay, so most of the students, regardless of the strand, are applying to school college. I already mentioned that. And, and some have already actually applied for ECCs and ELUCs. Reasons for the choice of schools, pre tuition, location, and reputation of schools already mentioned. Choice of the score, this is basically. The, as you already mentioned, the choose the strand is being chosen because of what they plan to go to do in college. 
So that's the, the way it's, it's so there's vertical alignment. And uh, free tuition uh, would be helpful for most students, but not a big fac deciding factor for college attendance. Some of the students express concerns about the law saying that it, it has made college admission requirements more stringent. That's what some mentioned that the free tuition influenced the decision to choose issues in LUC. Okay. Okay, so summary points student selection are, and tracks are primarily based on convenience, personal preferences, uh, affordability, and an influence of parents and peers. In general, students appreciate the additional two years of schooling. Uh, the opportunity to test the adult courses they will be they'll take up in college and help improve their uh, char uh, character or attitude, so uh, mental preparation for college, equip them with additional knowledge and skills on the strands they, they specialize in. However, the extent of their appreciation largely dependent on the quality of teaching. So basically, it's that's the, they appreciate the additional year if the teacher is interesting or is teaching them. If not, then uh, same maybe just a repeat of general high school subjects. So that's how uh, the relevance of the subject and the thought and the learning resources and facilities available. So it's mainly dependent on uh, teachers and resources that are available for learning. Uh, it, uh, both uh, are not entirely confident. That's the other thing that uh, we've gathered. They're not confident that they will, despite having NCT and, and other qualifications, they feel that the company still prefer college graduates. Most of the kids to 12 graduates tend to go to college. That's the thing that we realize. That they still want to go to college, most of them. Uh, and uh, working is just a temporary solution. Most apply uh, uh, or have already applied to issues and LUCs. That's, that's the uh, real, uh, what they told us. Okay. So we shift now to the perspective of the firms. Uh, we this is the, the firms that we uh, 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 host uh, human resource officers we interviewed in the National Capital Region. Uh, this is the type of uh, businesses that we, we uh, and the size of employment and, uh, and, and so they have uh, NCR, you have Reg uh, Cebu and uh, Alabar so on. So that's, that's the that's the regions we visited for, for the study. So the discussion points for the firms uh, are six. So you have firm understanding of the K-12 program and curriculum, willingness of the firms to hire K-12 graduates, types of jobs uh, companies are willing to offer, skills competencies required by the employer's adjustment in hiring policies, training assistance needed by K-12 graduates to make them employable or, or more employable. Okay. So all firms have some understanding, but they lack familiar, familiarity with the senior high school curriculum, uh, which uh, enable them to gauge the capacity of senior high school students. So the government has to basically, the, the most of the firms know that there is a senior high school, but they are not very familiar with what is taught or what competencies are being produced in senior high school. So that's the firm's uh, assessment, the partnership with training for training and work immersion industries is needed, so, but to, to, do, to know more about the graduates. Majority are willing to hire science school, but uh, some firms gave the preconditions for hiring, the requiring competencies and, uh, and uh, specialized skills, improving work immersion experience, offering low rank positions. Uh, only low positions in local government units can be offered to uh, existing due to existing policies of uh, Civil Service Commission. I think the policy that is mentioned here is that up to now the Civil Service Commission requires second year college graduates with the lowest rank, which uh, is an old, uh, so basically if you redefine it, it's senior high school graduates because that's two years of education. But the law, the Civil Service is still there, still stands. So it, ha it has to be really defined and look at uh, to allow senior senior high school graduates to work for government. Most firms offer the same jobs for both senior high school. So the firms cannot distinguish uh, junior high school graduates from senior high school graduates. Of course, there are only a few of them, perhaps, in the labor market at, at that time. But they don't distinguish, uh, necessarily distinguish that, too. So the current number of hours for uh, work immersion, uh, the minimum for the curriculum is 80 hours, is not enough. Uh, for some firms, uh, firms that, that require a minimum practicum of up to 250 hours 
uh, for some of the skills. So, but only the ERs is built in into the curriculum. Private sector association mentioned that uh, about how to make companies provide at least 200 hours so, of working mission. So that's that has to be coordinated with business associations and all of that. So the working mission is 80 the 80 hours requirement for working mission is not enough for firms. There's confusion of moving up and completion of what. So basically, is the, are the high school graduate or not? Essentially, for grade 10. Uh, so that's the. Uh, they're confused because the uh, if they don't distinguish between junior high school and senior high school, so what is it is a junior high school who is now moving up to senior high school, a high school graduate or not? Basically, please concern that uh, whether juniors can be accepted considering their ages, 16 to 17. Uh, this has always been mentioned that uh, they have to be 18 to be employed. Uh, according to PCCI, the, the junior high school no longer receives diploma but a certificate of completion. So. But that's again a confusion about uh, moving up completion or graduation for junior high school and, and senior high schools. More firms preserve senior high school graduates to be not work ready. So that's basically the, there is concerns about inadequate technical and behavioral skills of senior high school graduates as well as the lack of. So, base, so this is uh, a, a common uh, uh, comment and essentially I think it's very much because they don't understand much or they're not very much familiar with what's being taught in in, in senior high school, so there's a lot of uh, things that has to be done. So this is how we summarized it. So most firms are reluctant to hire, so most firms lack in deep knowledge. Basically, I think there should be a, a lot of the, the uh, information campaign of what uh, the senior high school program is about to firms has to be continued. And even the familiarity with work immersion uh, experience Working with firms should be also uh, used as a venue for that. Most firms perceive senior high schools are not work ready. So the basic reason is that the minimum 80 hour uh, work permission requirement is not enough. For of course, uh, it, it varies a lot from what what skills are expected from senior high school. Ensure that uh, these uh, students are deployed in work immersion being used that complement the tracks so that's that the other thing so basically it's just a requirement of 80 hours regardless of where you are basically so maybe that's if there's no place to put a student they must put it anywhere even if it's not aligned to what his uh, track is uh, strand is uh, so maybe implement a longer and competency oriented work immersion for students so this would be uh, thrust out so the one size fits all 80 hours may be have to be uh, uh, reconsidered. Most senior high school students are not confident, they themselves are not confident they will get a job after completing high school. So they believe that uh, the firm still would like to hire college graduates if this college graduates is on the line. So the improving awareness is a very important thing. Uh, of, of So even if we are already in the third year of implementation, we have to continue, the firms still don't understand the program, so they have to continue uh, advocating with firms about what senior high school, what's supposed to be, what, you ex what firms can expect from senior high schools. Improve the arrangement of taking accept uh, acceptability of the firms of NC assessments. That's, that's one. Uh, uh, NC assessment is an important thing. Uh, so there are several holders. The students, some of the students may not, may not have the money to pay for the, for the fees. Two, the schools may not have, we are not, may not be, uh, have incentive enough to arrange. As I've said, most of the students we talked to that have, were able to take the NCs because the schools themselves arrange for the NC uh, that, uh, with, an, uh, with an assessment center. So it's not the students, it's not the students themselves who will find the assessment. Uh, you, you're expecting too much from a student to do that. So most of the students that were able to take the NC are the students where the school arranged for the NC assessment. So, so that's so that's so if we wa if employment is an employment is an, an as one of the um, exits of this program, then that has to be thought through. Maybe uh, the government can help do that and I, I don't know how whether, whether there's a need for subsidizing some of the poor students who cannot pay for the NC costs. Many employers offer elementary occupations to senior high schools. Others do not differentiate between senior high schools and, and junior high school. So as I already said, uh, um, most, uh, if there's a college graduate on the line, 
they will hire the cars graduate rather than regardless of what the, the, uh, the as we already mentioned that the government itself uh, has to look at its qualification requirements because uh, it still says that it's, it has to be a second year college graduate. So encouraging firms and government to, uh, to, to adjust their hiring policies so we'll look at that and then online job sites must, must uh, distinguish between junior high school and senior high school graduates, just, just high school graduates. Uh, so that's, 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 that's good to, do, to avoid the confusion. I uh, already mentioned that, and then uh, uh, Marina is so mentioned there as a government agency restricted from hiring senior high school. Most uh, senior high school uh, uh, students, regardless of tracks, plan to go to college. So that's the thing that we have to. Uh, I've already mentioned that uh, uh, I'm afraid that the students, because of the initial idea of tracking, they forget about there are double reasons why students are not interested on the core courses. Uh, one is that maybe the, uh, uh, to me, core courses is very important. If 75% of them are going to college, then core courses, the core courses are very important. So why are the students not interested in the core courses? Of course, there's a first blush reaction that uh, they are being tracked like that if you, they'll be tracked to ABM if they are business-minded uh, students and all of that. And, uh, but uh, going to college means this should have, be, this should have been taught the, uh, the general education subjects that, are, that has been moved already from college to senior high school. So that, that's the, that's, uh, remember that the CHED already reduced the amount of general education units in college, okay? Because those subjects are already moved in senior high school. Now, in senior high school, if they are being taught by junior high school teachers, they are being taught high school level core courses. So that's make the core courses uh, uh, a repeat for many of the senior high school students. So that, that's, that, I th that's the experience. So they should be taught college level general education in senior high school. Anyway, 75% are going to college, which they will need. Uh, so basically, there's, there's this, because of this uh, uh, perhaps birthing uh, issues, there's a lot of confusion. So we, we, we need to have uh, uh, the quality of experience of the students are very much dependent on the, on the quality of the teacher. So a teacher needs a lot of help, senior high school teacher needs a lot of help. And uh, I think what stands out is that uh, if the teacher is very able and very inquisitive and all that, he finds his own resources, if there's no resources, then the student experience is quite uh, appreciated. But if it's not, then you'll have a, a, a poor uh, delivery of, 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 of subjects in the senior high school, which as I've said, we mentioned repeat of the junior high school subject. So why are being, uh, the student will say, why are being taught this, this subject we already taught this, the, them in junior high school? That means the senior high school subject were just a repeat of junior high school, if, if that's the comment that you get, rather than a uh, higher level of, uh, of teaching, uh, which is basically the college level general education teaching they should be getting uh, from the program. Okay, so that's the... This is the people uh, responsible for all what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comprehensive presentation, Dr. Orbeta. Our next speaker is a senior research fellow here at the PIDS. He served as a secretary general to the then National Statistical Coordination Board. He is a professional statistician who has written topics on poverty measurement and analysis, education statistics, agricultural statistics, climate change, survey design, data mining, and statistical analysis of missing data. He finished a BS degree in applied mathematics, summa cum laude, at the De La Salle University. He also obtained both his MS and M PhD in statistics at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. Uh, thank you, good afternoon. 
Uh, this is joint work with uh, Dr. Clarissa David of UP, who's currently seconded to the World Bank, and my research assistant, Jana Dubismaros. Um, the presentation, firstly, uh, provides a brief background on the study, uh, gives some findings from national surveys, DEPED data, and also some key results on fieldwork, and finally closes with some ways forward. Uh, in 2012, I led a team here at PIDS in conducting a country study on out-of-school children. Uh, this was one of more than 20 country studies that fed into a global initiative on out-of-school children led by UNICEF and UNESCO. Uh, PIDS then also released a full the full report, two discussion papers, and two policy notes. These papers were uh, essentially examined the magnitude of the problem, uh, comparative trends across subgroups of location, sex, income groups of their families, as well as various possible causes of out-of-school children. The statistics uh, came from an examination of surveys such as APs, FLEMS, and LFS, all done by uh, the then NSO, now Philippine Statistics Authority, from 2005 to 2008, as well as from administrative data uh, report uh, systems from during the same period from DepEd, chiefly, uh, the basic education information system, supplemented also by results from field work in selected areas. Though the report uh, did not get officially accepted by DepEd until three years later, it was actually widely circulated. In 2015, the report uh, had an ad ad addendum chapter that compared data uh, in the country report with the most recent data in 2015. And in this, uh, we showed uh, deep declines in out-of-school children preference uh, prevalence for five-year-old and modest declines in primary and secondary ages. And we attributed these changes largely to the passage of and full implementation of mandatory kindergarten and the K-12 law, increased resources made available to DepEd, as well as the effects of the four Ps, Pantawid, uh, the, or the conditional cash transfer among poor families. So as part of a continuing effort um, to monitor out-of-school children in the country and taking account of recent global trends that suggest that out of number of out-of-school children fell steadily in the in decade following 2000, but that this progress has stopped in recent years, we wanted to further get updates on what is, what are, what's happening in the Philippines. Thus, a, the current study aimed to obtain recent estimates of uh, out-of-school children both in magnitude and rates, uh, profile out of school children and their families, as well as provide a discussion of the reasons uh, why the children are not in school, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Reyes, and what makes children at risk of dropping out of school. And also, we wanted to discuss and recommend specific policies to reduce out of children uh, in the country. Um, we note that the DepEd has uh, multiple programs and processes. Uh, designed specifically to reduce dropout rates and by extension the incidence of out-of-school children. These are chiefly the alternative delivery modes, ADMs, and the alternative learning system, or ALS. The first, ADMs, are, is a manner of modularized learning and teaching that will allow a learner not to attend school every day but still follow the calendar of the regular school year by doing self-study at home. For individual children, particularly with circumstances that uh, place them at risk of extended absence. This is delivered within the formal school system when students are within school age. On the other hand, the ELSE, non-formal learning, is targeted largely to learners who are adults or beyond school age and are delivered by ELSE teachers or coordinators who report directly to the division office and not based specifically generally in a school. ELSE coordinators are provided a working budget or allowance which they use to recruit students, run the classes, travel to the sites where classes are held, and provide all learning materials and other supporting materials. Uh, the ELS is the flagship program of the current DepEd administration, and we noted from field visits that ELS has had rapid expansion in certain divisions, some with very large operations, support also from LGUs, private donors, communities, businesses. Uh, also, we noted learners were very motivated and have almost zero expenses. Uh, many uh, were also having, there were also large programs in jails, but we noticed that ALS does not have very clear targets and goals. Passing rates can Im be improved, and some programs have very high passing rates, but others uh, 
uh, but other completion rates are very low. The availability of exams also tend to be inconsistent, and we, we would like to point out that uh, DepEd needs to take care that it does not turn into a perverse incentive for students in formal schools. Because uh, while it's targeted for learners who are fairly aged, but it doesn't, the DepEd does not necessarily prevent any school-aged children from being part of ALS. Uh, as, in my, and as in previous out-of-school children's studies and reports, we conducted a review of uh, administrative data from DepEd as well as results of uh, sample surveys, chief, chiefly the annual poverty indicator survey. And based on APIS data, we find the prevalence of out-of-school children uh, aged 5 to 15 years old at 5.3% in 2017, showing no improvement from 2014 when it was estimated at 5.2%, although still much lower than the 11.7% figure in 2008. Thus, out-of-school children trends in the country seem to be very similar to global trends in having no improvements in rates in recent years. Among five-year-old children uh, who are supposed to be in kinder, 189,000 did not attend school in 2017, much lower than 776,000 in 2008, but higher than 177,000 in 2014. For primary age children, 6 to 11, uh, the out-of-school children was estimated at 571,000, representing an increase from 2014 when it was 420,000, but still much lower than uh, 1.3 million in 2008. Uh, at the lower secondary age, I now say lower secondary because we now have uh, senior high, for 12 to 15 year old, the number of out of school children declined in 2017 to 475,000 from 980,000 in 2008 and 660,000 in 2014. And this represents by far uh, the lowest rate of 5.6% for the lower secondary level uh, since 2008 when it was at 10.5% uh, and 2014 when it was at 6.2%. A much higher percentage of those in the upper school age range, 16 to 17, the senior high uh, uh, age children, uh, is about the, the uh, percentage is about 17.4 percent, corresponding to about 768,000 children who did not attend school. Uh, across all levels, the out-of-school children rate is not evenly distributed uh, by region. ARM has the highest out-of-school children prevalence with slightly over 12% of children of school age not attending school. Uh, Soxar Gen, Calabarzon, and Mimaropa follow ARM with prevalence rates of over 6%. The lowest uh, rates of out-of-school children are at, uh, below, at or below 4% in NCR, Central Luzon, Bicol, and, and uh, Cordillera. So a key intervention strategy that should be considered by DepEd is to focus on dramatically reducing dropout rates in high out-of-school children areas which likely have acute economic and access constraints owing to generally underdeveloped nature of the provinces within these regions. For example, it is likely that physical access constraints in island provinces of Mimaropa remain a challenge and also the lack of resources and high poverty rates in ARM and Soxar Gen require a holistic approach to guiding children through school. School attendance is still largely associated with poverty, but economic issues interplay with gender issues. Uh, while three-fifths of the 1.2 million out-of-school children aged 5 to 15 belong to families in the bottom 25% of income distribution, two-thirds of the total out-of-school children uh, are boys, and even higher I have an even higher proportion can be found among those aged 5 to 15, 5 to 17, if you were to include the 16 and 17. Among primary age uh, out of school children, the most commonly selected reason for leaving school is lack of personal interest, followed closely by illness and disability, then by the high cost of education. Note that since the out-of-school children rate for primary age children is quite low uh, compared with uh, previous years, the remaining out-of-school children are really last-mile children who may be having acute difficulties and challenges and keeping them from school. 
Of note in the comparisons uh, uh, that I highlighted here between the sexes is that girls are perceived to be more likely to be kept home because they are, quote, too young for school and are for some unexplainable reason less likely to report having no nearby schools than boys. I'm not too sure what, what, what's the reason for that. No? Um, but among secondary age children, lack of interest is also the main reported reason for not being in school, followed by costs, then by illnesses. The education disparity against boys is not only as far as school participation, but goes into performance metrics. Females score better on the NAT generally than boys in both primary and secondary levels and in every subject tested. Although when you start looking at the, the mean percentage, percent scores, they're all 30s, 40s, uh, even overall, you'll see the numbers are around the 40s level. No? And uh, so that means if you're thinking of a normal distribution, and I think they're currently they're their, the ratings are supposed to be you are nearly proficient if you are within the range of 50 to 74 and low proficient if you are scoring 25 to 49. If, so roughly the scores are in the 40s range, so they are lowly, low proficiency. No? Uh, and, uh, so, and recent data, this is from, this is from 19, sorry, this is from 2016 to 2017, school year 2017. Uh, we were also given some recent data uh, from DepEd. This is new, this is not in the paper. Uh, this was given to us because PIDS also wrote recently a, uh, a report on uh, the, the sustainable development goals. Uh, we, we see that there is still persisting low proficiency. The MPS scores are less than 50 for grade 6 and grade 10, whether for problem solving, information literacy, or critical thinking. For grade 6 scores, the scores, uh, the scores are highest in Filipino. Uh, for grade 10, they're all low <laughs> in all subjects, but they're least in science and math, which is a bit of a problem. No? Um, so. And then, of course, we will also see that there is uh, varying proficiency across regions. Uh, some regions uh, performing much better NCR calibers and, and surprisingly ARM for grade 6. No? Uh, but the, in grade, for grade 10, it's NCR that, uh, and Cordillera that had uh, the better s scores no? uh, uh, compared with uh, other regions. Now, if we do an econometric analysis uh, using logistic regression of uh, trying to explain non-participation in school, uh, as, uh, assuming all other explanatory variables are constant, those more, most, more likely to be in school are children who come from the poor. Uh, also, among primary age kids, six-year-old children are the ones more likely to be out of school rather than uh, seven to, what's it, 11 years old. And then among lower secondary age, it's the older kids. Now, uh, also the ones who are at more risk of being out of school are those from regions with high pupil-to-teacher ratio because the pupil-to-teacher ratio is actually a proxy for uh, school quality, the learning quality. No? Uh, uh, boys, I already reported this earlier, are more likely to be out of school. Children with mothers who have little or no education. Those from large families. Children with families with older ho household heads. Primary school age children who are part of families where the household head is female. And lower secondary school age children from families with male household heads. That I'm not too sure why that is coming out. Um, also, the older the household head, it seems the less likely that, that the child will not be in school. That's a little bit uh, also uh, confusing why that's happening. Anyways, um, so aside from all of this... Uh, uh, examination, we, as I mentioned earlier, we conducted field interviews in eight study sites across some urban and rural areas throughout uh, the major islands, Luzon, Visayas, Mind and Mindanao, and even here in the NCR. The study areas uh, we chose were from among uh, some with high and low out-of-school children rates. We went to both uh, primary schools and secondary schools, talked with division superintendents or their representatives, ALS coordinators, um, other division personnel, school principals or heads, guidance uh, counseling coordinators, 
and even the students themselves who are at risk of dropping out, the sardos, the parents of the sardos, teachers of the sardos, and ALS learners. And in field interviews, we specifically ask uh, participants to elaborate on the earlier categories I showed you re regarding reasons for not being in school. In the process, it became clear to us that uh, the myriad factors which make up each of these are actually very inter interconnected and can usually be traced back uh, to poverty or the need to generate more income. Uh, based on interviews with uh, elementary and high school teachers and principals, it appears that the, all these risk factors evolve from one level to the next. And at the primary level, the common problems are extreme poverty, the absence of a parent, broken families, inability to read, and even domestic abuse or trauma. Once children reach junior high, risk factors become early marriage, pregnancy, peers or barcada, computer games, disciplinary problems, and work. The manner in which all these factors are connected relates to instability in the home life usually emanating from either acute poverty or the absence of parental guidance. Teachers and principals in elementary schools identify family problems right after extreme poverty as the most common reason for students' absenteeism and dropping out. These come in the form of separation of the parents, the absence of one or both parents because of work out of town or even out of the country, abandonment, domestic abuse, and in a few rare cases, even incest and sexual abuse. Two broad categories for these are unstable or unavailable parental care and Second, abuse or trauma. Straight from the testimonies of those who drop out of school, especially boys in high school, the reason also why they start accumulating absence is their barcada. Peer influence should, can be positive, we all know that, but in this, the cases of those who eventually left school, this is negative. As a group, they would leave the school premises and spend their day in computer shops playing games, or they would hang around outside with without any real activity, tambay, no? or they would go drinking. In many cases, the parents or guardians think they are in school and would just learn about the absence from teachers when home visitations are conducted in response to absenteeism. Computer shops provide an inexpensive means to access the internet, social media, and online gaming. These are located often within walking distance of a school, sometimes right across it. Some schools have attempted to work with LGUs to regulate entry of, of school-aged children during class hours or prohibit the operation of computer shops within a kilometer of the school. But this has been proven difficult to implement, particularly in a few areas we visited. Also problematic are mobile games, especially in urban areas where even public school students have smartphones and only data plans. They stay up all night and show up to class the next day groggy like zombies from the lack of sleep. No? And eventually, absenteeism arises and kids would start failing exams or getting low grades. That, that actually leads to lower motivation to complete schooling. And that's what actually we discovered as being lack of interest. They lack interest in schooling no? because they, they eventually get lower grades. No? They, they, they drop out or even fail the grade entirely. And we hear these students from teachers as well as the L AL students who openly admit that computer games and barcada are the reasons they ended up leaving school. The majority, vast majority of children at risk of dropping out come from families that are very poor. Reasons for initial signs of chronic absenteeism include having no money for allowances in some days, no transportation, no food, or they have to stay at home to care for their younger children, for their younger siblings, and transients of a family because they move in and out of communities for employment reasons. One student from a rural area in Aklan tells us that since their parents only have enough money to give one child an allowance, she and her sibling take turns going to school. Several students in the ALS program recount that the reason they initially would leave their education is because their parents would have to work some other place. And eventually, they would have to drop out uh, in, in the process, and this makes them older than their cohorts if they decide to go back to school. And then if they go back to school, that will put them at risk of bullying. Well, ay, matanda ka na, no? Embarrassment, 
generally losing further interest in schooling. Parents of Sardos or out-of-school children, and sometimes the former students themselves when they are in the ALS, are asked specifically what led them to, to their refusal to go to school. Bakit ayaw mo pumasok? No? Uh, for many, the real reason, especially among boys, is that they fail exams and anticipate they will fail the grade. Even teachers point out that it is poor academic performance that depresses the motivation and interest of students. And this trajectory starts in the very early grades, specifically traced all the way back to whether or not they actually learned how to read. Uh, now, of course, we, when in, some strict er in some areas, uh, strict implementation of no reading, sorry, let me still go back to that. Uh, in some areas, strict implementation of no reading, no promotion in the early grades are being piloted. But teachers point out you know, that, that this will adversely impact on their PBBs, performance-based board, just because there is supposed to be zero dropout. No? So, unfortunately, no, it, this is an unintended consequence. But uh, there are some very good things that teachers are doing, you know, like remedial classes for non-readers, and in more enterprising schools, they have a body system where high-performing students are assigned to assist uh, the others. No? And it seems to be working. Now, in grades uh, 7 to 11, when girls drop out, one of the most common reasons is early pregnancy. These are products of boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, and, and will lead to early marriage. No? Um, and uh, further, uh, in empirical analysis of survey data, as I already mentioned, uh, and through historical research, it's also been made clear that the education level of parents is a significant predictor of the educational attainment of the child. So unfortunately, if you have low education for parents, like, very likely, uh, this affects no? uh, the learning process. Parents of children who, who habit, habitually skip school, especially those who are in the higher grades, express their frustration over their inability to force their children to stay in school. They say they do everything, provide money, school the children for missing school, ask them about their progress, but they cannot seem to force them to attend. One mother in her frustration said she has tried everything to get her daughter to keep attending, you know, even to the extent of kneeling to her child, but none of it works. So schools and teachers should and can think of support mechanisms for families with these kinds of profiles. Teachers across the, visit, the sites we visited for this study all mentioned, uh, particularly on the supply side issue, uh, teacher workload as a very big bottleneck for addressing out-of-school children. They point out that they can do so much more for the students if they only had more time to focus on the teaching itself rather than all the responsibilities that piled onto them. In fact, we released a, a specific policy note on this. No? Uh, the workload comes not only from the education system itself but also from other agency. Paperwork and re reports related to seminars and trainings, they are compelled to attend designations in the school like guidance, being the uh, guidance coordinator, budget, disaster response, health officer, earthquake drills, and other disaster risk re and reduction management exercises, which demand their own sets of reports, mass immunization, which also requires reports, community mapping, deworming, feeding, population censuses with the national government, anti-drug programs, elections, the list goes on. No? DepEd has requested, I think, ADB to conduct a timing survey for, uh, of teachers as well as to conduct a profiling of teachers, their teaching load, and the different assignments. Such a study will definitely audit uh, not only the time spent by teachers doing non-teaching related work, but also list all the paperwork demands, no? like reports, training, seminars, and additional responsibilities created by non-DepEd agencies. Mass promotion is the unspoken, unofficial mode of reducing out-of-school children. The push to report zero dropout has been uh, in the DepEd system for a long time and has been blamed often for the unofficial practice of mass promotion because the signaling is if you, a child flunks, you have to explain, you have to give a report. Why is it your, these kids are, are getting bad grades? 
the teachers have to write out all these explanations on a form and then teachers feel like it is always their fault when the children get held back or drop out. And it signals them that the system would rather push the children up to the next grade rather than make them stay on uh, if they fail. So multiple times also the teachers, as I already mentioned, brought up the fact that the PBB, performance-based bonus, is tied to the dropout rate. No? Uh, so clearly these kinds of incentives, performance incentives, are causing, uh, an, an again, another unintended consequence. No? Uh, although much less of a problem now than in years past, physical access to schools remains an issue for a subset of the population, especially for, uh, as, uh, as regards high schools. Access to high school is particularly acute for many areas, cost or, or time to, of, or of transportation from a family's village to the nearest, nearest high school could be prohibitive. And these are factors that make it likely a student will start a year but fail to complete it. The communities that are far from high schools become targets for all teachers because they have large population of adults without a high school degree. They, the ALS teachers will travel to these communities to deliver education. But really, there must be a need for a, much, a thorough assessment of the location of, this, of these remote communities and the number of under, underserved school-aged children, particularly of uh, high school age, whether lower secondary or upper secondary. Building more schools may be cost-effective for some areas, but there should be alternative solutions for access to formal schooling. And um, how we close with our report with uh, a number of suggestions to address these barriers and bottlenecks to schooling. But before we me mention this, we also, I'm not sure if there's anybody here from the PSA, but it would be helpful if the APIS questionnaire, no, uh, perhaps there could be an extra question, a follow-up question about the lack of personal interest so that DepEd and other stakeholders can help, can break down what does lack of interest really mean uh, and then consequently determine the specific interventions required. So we uh, give this suggestion in the study. No? Uh, further, in 2014, we, even as early as 2014, three, uh, how many years ago, five years ago already, we suggested that DepEd not only make effective use of their gender exemplars and activity-based tools, but specifically account for different, differing interests of boys and girls. We also suggest, suggest the adoption of affirmative action in the employment of teachers because we like it or not, 90% of our teachers are in the bureaucracy are female. No? And uh, so we need to have more males uh, in the bureaucracy. We, we, we suggested that perhaps also they could you know, work with CHED to provide specific teaching scholarships to males. But of course, sometimes that's kind of politically unwise. No? I might say, why are you preparing males than females? No? Uh, especially if there is a PCW. No? Oh, and I'm sorry if, if there's a... <laughs> Anyways, um, but DepEd, I mean, at least initially, there should be some ways for you to address all of this because gender is not just about female. You know, I think that's one of the things we need to re, re, re communicate. No? Uh, it's about equality, gender equality. Anyways, DepEd, we also suggested that they should work with DSWD. This has been a time long uh, suggestion I've been making that we should be uh, adopting an increased allowance for boys. Uh, given the fact that the, we have differing opportunity costs between boys and girls, uh, particularly as they age. The main and urgent recommendation to, the, to address the last mile concerns as well as the poor quality of education children receive is really to address partly the human resource allocations of DepEd, in particular in order to deload teachers of admin and other duties unrelated to teaching DepEd needs to systematically study and address their human resource shortages. In, I already mentioned that in, uh, we recommended a time-use study for teachers even as early as 2014, and we're glad that ADB is working with, with DepEd on this. But in the meantime, DepEd can work with DBM on, more, on trying to eventually come up with more admin plantilla positions and also addressing issues about, I mean, the reason why we have very few guidance counselors and teachers are becoming the de facto guidance counselors. No? Uh, apparently, it has to do with low 
low salaries being given for entry level positions of guidance counselors even if they have master's degrees already no and of course there are already very few but you know if you have few few graduating from guidance uh, from guidance counseling and psychology taking master's degrees even fewer and so how can you address if you're you're paying people very little no but in the meantime, DEPED could explore working with the private sector to channel some admin support to public schools. We know that private elementary and high schools have regular non-teaching staff who, who could be possibly detailed to public schools, uh, nearby public schools. And, or alternatively, work, uh, DEPED could work with bachelor's programs in elementary and secondary education uh, to have the undergrad students spend a semester or even a year every day in a public school doing this kind of work uh, in coordination with CHED. There are problems like computer shops, uh, disciplinary issues through one c that clearly needs close LGU cooperation with DepEd. Other forms of active LGU support is in ALS and intermittent support to operational needs. But unfortunately, I don't think there's a direct relationship between the LGU and education units, except for the seat of the principal on the SEF board. Uh, DepEd needs to be strategic in collaborating with the DILG and in finding advocacy champions at the field level, whether among local chief executives or community leaders. There are also many examples of effective small initiatives in schools or divisions, such as peer mentoring that I mentioned earlier and, and others uh, early reading remediation. But it is unclear if DepEd currently has a mechanism to host knowledge that emanates from the schools and broadcast it to the rest of the bureaucracy as a good practice so that the small initiatives can eventually be adopted in other areas. It's critical to engender reading comprehension and a willingness uh, and interest in reading in the early grades for students to stay motivated throughout their education. But in almost all schools, reading is something, while it's reading is something that students have to do to go through their lessons, but there are no specific activities to encourage reading for le leisure or even to have non-textbooks and workbooks available for students to read while in school premises. You have libraries with many textbooks, but, non, but what about non-textbooks? No? DepEd will need to be creative about reading programs to improve the appreciation for reading, appreciation for stories, narratives, so that children can learn critical thinking without, uh, through reading and listening to teachers read, which provides modeling opportunities that are important for older children. Beyond the most simple reading ability needed to clear, to clear grades 1 to 3, further reading appreciation programs can be encouraged through private donors or community engagements. In many formal schools, the formal policy is to have advanced section of high performers and then all the other students are supposedly randomly assigned to sections. However, many of the schools visited say they have a last section. But of course, they, they deny that the group the students are grouped according to performance. The reality is there would be two options in dealing with this unofficial policy no? of putting the challenging students in one section. One is discourage this practice altogether. Um, but there's another option which is to retain the practice but at least give the classes special treatment in terms of teacher support because currently well, what you've noticed is the ones with the home room, the, the last... Uh, teachers, the last sections, are usually the, the young teachers uh, who, may not been, who may not know what to do. No? Uh, I, I remember there was one teacher who really told me it was difficult for me when she, she was relaying a story of a child who, who, was, who, who not she noticed had problems, but he had slashed his wrist. What do you do when you had no kind of training? I mean, uh, you, become, you try to become a friend, but then... You know, I mean, our teachers are not trained for these kinds of things, you know. So I, we really need to start rethinking what's happening in our, in our, in our, in, and can you imagine, no? um, I mean, these are just a few small stories. I'm not sure whether this is all representative, but the, the, the fact that we hear these stories is something of concern, no? Uh, at the very least, we could assign the most experienced teacher in many of these last section classes. 
uh, and the students, a majority of them are usually the male students. So maybe it's important to have a male homeroom teacher who may be in a better position to discipline unruly male teenagers. No? Uh, being over age for, the, for grade also puts children at risk of dropping out. And whenever possible, uh, we, the, we could use alternative delivery modes to help students not only catch up to their delayed grade, but eventually skip a grade so that eventually they can be with their cohorts. Uh, the ALS program has been uh, also catching some of the un undereducated parents, but in formal schools, can somehow also aim to help design specific learning programs that will engage with parents continuing education, especially given that there is a need for everyone to be given opportunities for lifelong learning. Now, as also I'm a bit worried now that as we recognize that some areas, especially geographically isolated and disadvantaged areas, no, the GDAS, or even bigger areas like the new BARM, no, uh, they face many development challenges, but I'm not too sure whether DepEd or other national government agencies are having special programs to ensure that these areas are not being left behind. While there are um, the specific and direct, indirect causes, direct and indirect causes for out-of-school children are, we have already enumerated them, the majority somehow are interlinked with poverty, hunger, large family sizes, transients of families, unstable home conditions where children are left without adult guidance, and the accumulated effects of chronic hunger, undernutrition, early pregnancy, are all closely linked to poverty conditions of a family. Government programs eventually need to address poverty, uh, and they, but they currently are, do, do not appear to be differentiated. They're always one size fits all. No? You give 300, 500 for CCT, you give this amount. It's always a fixed amount given to everybody, not recognizing the different kinds of things, uh, different shaded needs of the poor. Child-centered poverty alleviation programs will require also co close coordination, not just with, you know, it's not important to just throw everything at DepEd, but DepEd will need to work together with lots of government agencies with mandates specifically to protect and promote the welfare of children. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much for that uh, very informative presentation, Dr. Albert. Our last speaker this afternoon is another research fellow here at the PIDS. He coordinates the Institute's um, research program on population, health, and nutrition policy. He is also a member of the National Transfers Account Project, a global network of researchers and academics that constructs and analyzes economic life cycle accounts that measures how people at each age produce, consume, share resources, and save for the future. He was a postgraduate research fellow at the East-West Center in Honolulu and holds a PhD in economics from the University of Hawaii. He obtained his Master of Statistics and Bachelor Degree in Development Studies, Manya Cum Laude, from the University of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Michael Abrigo. Marami pong salamat. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a joint work with our colleagues at the NTA Philippines country team, um, Rachel Raselis and Alex Herin from the University of the Philippines, uh, Ian Salas from Johns Hopkins, and our own uh, Danica Ortiz and Zandra Tam. Okay, uh, kanina, the discussions were about uh, education, human capital, and uh, dealt more about um, individuals, students, Mga more micro, but here in, in uh, demographic dividend, we will go a little bit ha uh, higher. So we will be dealing about uh, population age distributions and the macroeconomy. So um, first slide ko is this. The Philippines is aging. This might be a surprise for many Filipinos, but the Philippines is aging. Uh, according to PSA, uh, 20 2015, about 5% of the Filipinos are 60, 
age 65 years and older. Uh, these are SMS from the UN World Population Projections from 2017, and, it, and it's saying that uh, right now, 2019, uh, at least 7% of Filipinos are aged 65 and older. Uh, technically, that classifies us as an aging population. And soon enough, uh, I'm aged 32 y this year. Uh, uh, pag nag, uh, pag nag retire ako, 30 years after, uh, we will be an aged society, aged, aged population. And then after that, uh, a few years after, 30 years pa, uh, we will be a super aged population. That's just in a span of two generations. So baka ngayon hindi pa natin masyadong nafeel pero soon enough uh, we will be an aging uh, we are an aging we will be an aged and we will be a super aged population like many parts of the world. And I'm not say I'm, I'm saying that it's not really a bad thing. It's actually a good news for us. It's a good news. It's actually a story of our success, of our uh, collective success as a Filipino. Uh, ibig sabihin kasi because we are aging, ibig sabihin we were able to conquer those challenges that we had before. Uh, those challenges about health, about income, no overcome natin yung marami doon. So we are able to provide healthcare, vaccination, uh, uh, water, sanitation, many of those problems we are able to deal, although we still have those problems right now. So aging is a good news. Still, uh, it comes with both challenges and prospects. Challenge because, as we all know, pag mas marami and we need to somehow finance the consumption of these people. And that, that comes in terms of pension. So, dahil wala silang trabaho, somehow someone has to pay for their consumption. And one of that is pension. And we have a lot of, uh, of these things. So, meron tayong SSS, GSIS. We have uh, socialized pension, which is funded from the, our general taxes. Another challenge is that uh, elderly, uh, they tend to have uh, these uh, medical conditions na mas mahal on average. So yung healthcare nila mas mahal. Pag mas marami yung mas patatanda, ibig sabihin mas marami tayong babayaran na healthcare. So that's the challenge. But then there is this prospect, there is this uh, um, promise na dahil mas maraming tatanda and because uh, life expectancy is growing, so they, people will look forward to longer years of retirement, uh, the expectation is I need to save. And when people save, that goes back into the economy and that raises productivity for everyone who's working. So that's a good for the economy. So this uh, these study actually uh, is linked to that uh, demographic transition in the Philippines. And we want to answer these questions. One is, uh, how may the demographic transition that we're experiencing right now affect the material measures of well-being? So, ang gusto natin material measures of well-being, not necessarily income. Dahil at the end of the day, ang gusto naman natin, we want to consume more because we want to feel better. We want to have better well-being. And then, the next question is, have we benefited from this so-called demographic dividend? And finally, what does public policy have to do with this uh, population demographic dividend? So, first question is, uh, before anything else, what is the demographic dividend? So, Demographic dividend uh, technically is, a, is this direct and measurable impact of the, the demographic transition on material measures of well-being. So back in the 1960s, uh, total fertility rate in the Philippines was about what uh, six, seven, uh, seven births per woman over her lifetime. Um, from 70s up to 90s, mababasa ng six, and now our TFR is about uh, less than three. So because of that, and also because of uh, increasing longevity, we have this uh, bulge of people uh, going towards uh, prime age. So mas, mas mabilis na dumadami yung workers natin compared to our uh, consumers. Uh, in that case, this is, uh, we have two, two things. So yung first demographic dividend is this accounting effect. Mas, mas dumadami lang yung nagtatrabaho kaysa doon sa kumukonsuma. Okay, walang sinabi about about productivity, dumami lang talaga nito trabaho, essentially. So because of that, uh, on average, uh, income will increase, per in income per capita will increase, and so uh, and therefore, consumption per capita will also increase. But also, there is this behavioral effect from this demographic transition, which we call the second demographic dividend. So 
when the, when f uh, number of children per households go down, people tend to invest more on children. So dahil dati kung para yung sampu yung anak mo, uh, yung mga parents mo sampu ang anak, so mas konti mas konti yung kaya nilang invest sa mga anak nila. Pero dahil ngayon yung mga anak natin konti na lang tatlo dalawa isa, we can invest more on them. And eventually when they grow up, they are invested. We have invested more on their human capital, so they would become more productive. And then the second part is uh, on savings. This is the, the uh, you said kanina, na because we are faced with longer years of retirement, we tend to save more. And that, that also leads to greater productivity. So the demographic dividend, these are potentials for additional growth. Kumbaga sa kasale promise, promise pa lang siya. But then it's not free. Even if it's a dividend, it's not free because people, we need to work to achieve those dividends. For instance, uh, first demographic dividend is a is an accounting effect, but still, kung yung mga tao naging worker sila bata naging worker kung wala naman silang trabaho we will not realize this first demographic dividend. Yung second demographic dividend these are investments uh, human capital or in, in capital or in savings. Kung wala tayong schools wala tayong teachers na pupuntahan ng mga bata at kung gusto nila mag-aral wala tayong second demographic dividend. If, even if we have the money, we want to invest, but we don't have the vehicle, we don't have the, the financial markets or the capital market, kung saan natin invest yung pera natin for savings, wala tayong second demographic dividend. So these demographic dividends are potentials, and nasa atin yun if you want to achieve those potentials. So dalawang, uh, dalawang part yung presentation ko. One is looking uh, in our past, and second is looking to the future. Uh, first is I want to look at the trends uh, in population uh, and actually generation, generational economy in the Philippines from 1990 to 2015. So when I say generational economy, this is um, how people from different generations interact in the economy so that we would be able to produce and consume things and how we would be able to share stuff, share uh, resources para matugunan natin yung differences across the life cycle. And in order to do that, uh, we have estimated national transfer accounts for the Philippines from 1990 to 2015. I'll go over through that uh, in a while. So this is a typical Filipino's uh, economic life cycle in 2015. These are the kind of estimates that we, what we do uh, with the national transfer accounts. Yung patas, uh, that would be labor income. That would include uh, earnings from from employment, uh, kasama din yan yung self-employment income, kasama din yan yung mga benefits like SSS, GSIS, so on and so forth. Uh, this includes yung mga Pilipino, nagtatrabaho sa Pilipinas, at yung mga OFWs natin. Uh, yung parang pael na nakahiga, that would be consumption, and it's divided by public and private consumption. It would include your, uh, human, your consumption on health, on education, and others. Okay? Pag mas, mata, pag mas masaas yung uh, labor income kaysa dun sa consumption, ibig sabihin meron tayong surplus. Pag mas malaki yung uh, consumption kaysa sa labor income, we have deficits. And throughout our lifetime, mulang kukunti lang yung pagkakataon na yung income natin from labor and our consumption ay equal. For the most part, either sobra tayo or kulang tayo. And somehow, there's this generation, generational economy that works that somehow... Uh, yung, mga, yung mga kulang natin, napupunuan natin. Okay? And this is per, in per capita terms. Uh, kahit ganyan yung itsura niya, when we uh, take into account population, ibang-iba siya. Because in the Philippines, kahit konti, in per capita terms, yung consumption ng mga bata, kasi syempre maliliit sila, konti pagkain, maliliit yung mga damit. Pag, pag tinake into account mo yung dami nila, actually, malaki yung consumption nila compared to the rest of the population. Kumpara dun sa mga matatanda na mas mahal pero mas kaunti sila. So population age distribution matters. And throughout, uh, from, for the last 25 years, we have improved a lot. Okay? So ito yung, uh, yung labor income and consumption per capita by age natin from 1990 to 2015. So between 1990 and 2000, parang wala nangyayari. Halos pareho lang yung labor income and consumption, but after that, we have this, we, we see this big jump uh, in, in labor income and consumption. And what is, what I'm happy about uh, these results is that 
what we find is that um, yung consumption natin on education actually grows year on year about two three percent, and for health are about that same about about the same. So that's actually good for us because eventually because we're investing on our on our children, yung iba jamo kikita nyo na sa 2015 na graph we were actually more productive because of those investments. Well, yung iba is of course maganda yung ating economic policy, but many of it is because of our human capital investments. So Tinanggal natin yung labor, pag uh, di, uh, minus natin from consumption yung labor income, we would have this, what we call the life cycle deficit. Pag nasa taas ka ng graph, that, that would be a deficit, so you're consuming more than what you earn. Pag nasa baba, that would be a surplus, you're earning more than what you, the, what you consume. And for the past 25 years, ito yung apparent. First is that uh, yung deficit natin by age is increasing. As well as yung surplus natin increasing then, that's one. And the other is that actually yung years kung saan tayo may mga surpluses is actually getting younger. So in a way, uh, I, I try to see. I, I'd like to see it as a as a, some structural thing, because usually uh, because we have invested on our children, so they are uh, more productive than the earlier generations. That's why mas mas malaki income nila on, on average. So, kita natin merong mga deficits, may mga surplus. So, how do we fund? How do we fund this uh, uh, deficits in our economy? So, mainly dalawang dalawa lang yan. So, when we consume, there are three three ways to to fund our consumption. One is through working. The other is we get it from transfers. It could be transfers from from our relatives, from our family members, or from other households. So, kasama dyan yung mga remittances o kundi man uh, ako kasama ko yung nanay ko sa bahay, pag may pera siya, nandilibri siya ng Jollibee, o nagluluto siya sa bahay. So that would be part of transfers. Uh, pwede rin gobyerno, it could be mandated by the government. So, uh, kumita ako, nagbayad ako ng tax, binigay, pinambili ng uh, libro para sa mga estudyante, or pinayad para sa health insurance. Or it could also be through assets, asset-based reallocation. Meron akong extra money ngayon, sinave ko sa banko, eventually pag kailangan ko pwede kong isave. Or pwede naman yung kapitbahay ko, meron siyang extra money, inutang ko. Okay. So how, how do we finance our life cycle deficit for the past 25 years? Yung mga bata, uh, mostly transfers. Transfers from families. But uh, a little portion of that would be transfers from the government because this will be in the form of public education, public health, uh, defense, kasama dyan. Uh, but for the elderly, mas maraming options because they are able to save, they're able to, to do all this stuff. So, pwedeng transfers, mo, pero mostly asset-based reallocations. They're drawing from their savings that they've uh, built through the years. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, for the Philippines, uh, previously, before 2015, yung mga elderly, they are net givers of private transfers. So kung si Lolo at si Lola nakakuha ng pera, karamihan dyan, binibigay lang din niya sa mga mas bata sa kanya. Pero more recently, in 2015, yung mas marami na re-receive nila kaysa sa pinamimigay nila sa mga, sa mga kasama sila sa bahay. Okay? So the next question is, have we benefited from the demographic dividend? So ang ginawa natin, we try to decompose yung growth in consumption per worker uh, from 1990 to 2015 into its uh, components. This would be the support ratio, that would be the ratio of your effective number of workers to your effective number of consumers, consumption share, and output per worker. Yung first demographic dividend, you can see that in the growth at the support ratio. So, ibig sabihin niyan, pag, halimbawa, between 1990 to 2015, uh, consum out of that 2.2% growth in consumption per worker, yung 0.5 percentage point yan, that is because we have more workers, uh, we have workers growing faster than the number of consumers. So that's your first demographic dividend. That's quite substantial, half a percentage point. Uh, your second demographic dividend will be in your output per worker. Pero hindi lahat nito is your second demographic dividend. Kasi yung iba dyan, ginawa ng mga presidente, yung mga economic managers natin. So, 
So um, part of that would be from uh, greater productivity because we have invested on children and because we have, uh, we have uh, saved more, which raises productivity. Uh, next question is, uh, given now uh, we're getting this half a percent percentage point uh, uh, f demographic dividend and some from the from the labor productivity growth, will this continue into the future? Ito naman yung gusto natin talagang sagutin. Will our uh, population be in that sweet spot? If we look at the first demographic dividend, which is the often cited uh, demographic dividend, actually it will end by 2040. Okay. Wala na tayong demographic dividend after 2040. Actually, lagi siyang negative. Uh, in the parlance of yung mga medyo negative, uh, yan yung tatag lang demographic winter. Kasi mas marami na yung matanda, mas marami na yung magkoconsume. Actually, that will pull our uh, consumption per worker, uh, consumption per person down. So, hindi maganda yung population growth, yung population aging. But actually, uh, there's this second demographic dividend. Uh, which will increase into the future Kung, if we play our cards right. So that's about uh, almost uh, one full percentage point. That's quite a lot. So if we're growing, what, 6% uh, GDP capita? So para yung mga ano ba, seven, about seven, if we play our cards right. So going forward, um, for 2020 to 2060, what does policy have to do with it? So, ang, ang gusto natin dito, dito kasi we're just looking at uh, just the demography, changing lang yung population age structure natin. What if we, uh, uh, what if we change policy? Okay, so papunta na tayo sa Pilipinas. So, we, we made this uh, macroeconomic uh, demographic model which takes into account yung changing demographic distribution at yung mga... Uh, interaction uh, across different generations and economy to see how different policies might affect uh, consumption and fiscal balance. So these are projections based on some simulation model. This is not a forecast. So possibly na malayo tayo sa buhay, but in, in this case, we're just playing what if this is the world and we're changing parts of it. So we, ang, ang goal natin is we will be able to tease out and the effect on policy, hopefully. So we have four projection scenarios, business as usual. Uh, essentially, we will, we will keep everything the same as in 2015 age profiles. Uh, and we'll labor, for all the scenarios we would assume, we assumed na labor productivity will grow by 1.5%. So we, we assumed away yung second demographic dividend and we will be relying on the first demographic dividend here. Our population age distribution will be is from the uh, UN World Population Projections 2017. And we have two, uh, two welfare scenarios. Yung welfare scenario one is what if yung public sector natin will try to mimic yung high income pero low transfer countries like the US and, and, uh, and Spain. Yung welfare two naman, uh, what if we mimic yung uh, public sector ng high income, high public transfers na countries, uh, mostly in Scandinavian countries and, and, and in Europe. And finally, labor reform, uh, we keep everything similar, same as 2015, but because we know that uh, with aging population, longevity will increase also, what if yung mga tao, pwedeng hindi muna sila mag-retire? They will continue working uh, because, well, they can work. So just to give you an idea, yung anong, anong ibig kong sabihin, uh, this is per capita public transfer inflows. This would be the benefits that we receive on average by age from the government. So kung mapansin nyo rito, yung business as usual, that would be the Philippines for 2015. Uh, merong counting bump between 0 to 20. This would be mostly from uh, education. And then we have 60 to 80. This will include healthcare, pensions, and so on. Uh, meron pa rin siyempre yung between 20 to 60 because part of this will be in the form of general uh, public services. So yung mga roads, bridges, uh, public defense, it will be part of that. So yung welfare reform one, that would be the shape of what, this is what you would expect in the US and Spain. So mataas yung education, yung, yung mga nag-aaral, pero mas mataas yung mga retirees. Uh, still, yung welfare reform too, it, this would be Scandinavian countries, so 
mas mataas pa lalo yung kanilang uh, spending, public spending on education and for the elderly. Sa labor reform, wala tayong binago. Ito naman yung catch. Siyempre, pag tinaasan mo yung, ibibig, yung ibibigay mo sa tao, kailangan mong bawiin somewhere. You have to tax these people. So in the Philippines, ganito yung tura ng ating tax profile essentially for the Philippines. Uh, mukha lang siyang ganyan sa per capita, pero pag ginawa mo siyang aggregate, kung multiply mo sa population, mukha na siyang labor income. Uh, for welfare reform, one, siyempre tataas yung tax ng mga, especially yung mga working, mas tataas pa lalo sa welfare reform. Two, uh, pareho lang sa labor reform. Dito sa per capita labor income, uh, pare-pareho siya everywhere except for yung labor reform scenario where, as I mentioned, dahil hahaba yung buhay ng mga tao, on average life expectancy, uh, what if we allow them to work longer years? And this is the result. We just look at two results. One is consumption. So we have results, uh, projection results for 2015 to 2060. So sabi natin kanina, uh, it, we would be an aged society by around uh, 2045. Tama ba? Uh, before 2050. Most of the increase uh, in consumption will be is, is actually coming from that uh, assumption of our assumption that uh, productivity will grow by 1.5 percent. Okay, but then because of these different uh, policy reforms, what if what if reforms, you will see that given the same uh, population age distribution, given the same productivity growth, actually we can be better. We can actually. Uh, uh, consume more. So that, that is actually good for our well-being. Siyempre, ang cash dito, uh, many of it, much of it, will be from the, by the public sector. That It will be course to the public sector. But eventually, surely, the, 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 the people will, act, will actually consume it. Okay? So this is the good part. We can be better with public policy. This is the not-so-good part. Someone has to pay. And because of, kahit wala tayong gawin, when you look at the business as usual scenario, magbago man tayo hindi, our debt will increase just because we will have more aged uh, people in society. I'm not saying that they are, well, partly, syempre, mas maraming sila, so syempre, mas maraming kalanting resources and there would be less uh, people who will be taxed, but it, this is it. So, in 2015, our Public debt is about six trillion. By 2040, 2045, 2050, it will increase based on these projections tenfold, 60 trillion. Okay, so we can be better with reform. So medyo bababa ng konte because we are taxing people uh, more, but still mas mataas yung ating kailangan bunuin. So ganun din as a share of primary income right now, close to 50 percent of primary income natin as a, as a economy, yun yung debt natin, uh, in 2040-2050, that's about 100-150% of our primary income. So it's a good thing, but then someone has to pay. Uh, that said, uh, these are the key takeaways that I, that I want us to remember. One is we have done a lot, we've, we've gone through a lot of improvements in the past 25 years, and that is a success for the Filipino people. Uh, I want to highlight that demographic dividends are potentials. It will always be there. It's just a matter of will we be able to, to really realize these potentials. So the first demographic dividend, because this is a, a mechanical uh, accounting effect, we won't have the first demographic dividend or the second demographic dividend if fertility does not fall. We require, it requires fertility to fall for the demographic transition to happen. But we're not saying na dapat pinupwesa natin yung tao, na dapat ganito lang karami yung anak nyo. We need to equip them na if they decide na ganito karami yung anak natin, kaya nilang ma-achieve. Uh, by our last estimate, uh, five ba? Seven, no, five. Yung, uh, ano sabihin? Okay, for the second demographic dividend, uh, this is also potential, but it requires those investments to be realized. Okay, so kailangan natin ng schools, kailangan natin ng hospitals, kailangan natin ng finan working financial markets. And finally, uh, I want to highlight that public policy plays an important role in welfare, as we've shown earlier, that we could uh, actually uh, 
consume more with public policy, but then someone has to uh, pay. We need to balance it with the costs. And we, when I say this, I want to say that we need to also not look, not look, I want to say that hindi lang income inequality yung problema natin. We also need to look at generational equity. Okay? Maybe this generation is, is a very, uh, very lucky one because we have all these libre, libre pa, pa healthcare, libre pa education, libre pa college, but eventually, uh, yung mga nagbabayad nyo yun, tatanda din, someone will pay for that. Habang dumadama yung nililibre natin at kumakonti yung nagbabayad, will we be, still be able to afford the same level of, ano ba, of libre, of, of public service na, na, na enjoy natin ngayon? And finally, uh, demography matters in public policy. Even if on average, uh, mukha siyang maayos. When we take into account yung age distribution ng, ng economy natin, and it's changing, baka iba na yung picture. Uh, with that, maraming pong salamat. So thank you so much for that mind-stimulating presentation, Dr. Abrigo. May I request all the uh, three presenters to be in front. Let us proceed to the open forum. May, we rem may I remind our um, audience to please state your names and your affiliation before asking the question? So we would like to ask the first question. Yes, ma'am. Madang hapon, I'm Ched Arzadon from UP College of Education. Ano? Uh, mayroon lang akong reaction uh, about the analysis of the supply side of the OOSC, uh, the school children. I felt that uh, there's the impression that the decision to drop out is somewhat irrational. Ano? Parang it goes ac against what we teach that you know, men are rational beings. Because I'm also doing my study on dropouts and abortas among uh, fishing, some fishing village and then mountain province, Benguet, upland you know, farming. I found that uh, the decision to drop out is not, you know, it's a rational decision. Uh, for example, children who work in the market, uh, fish port, and then fishing, they work all night or you know, from 3 o'clock. And so when they go to school in the morning, they're sleepy. And they're, you know, the class is in the morning. And the teachers would not talk about things that interest them. Because they, they want to know how to catch fish. You know how to increase my ano. Pero the same with you know computer gamers. Pano ko palalakasin yung aking ano na? But the teachers would not relate their lessons. That's why it's lack of interest. And then uh, why would uh, and then their exemplars. Yung kunyari sa fishing village. Ang kanilang exemplar yung piloto. And then sa farming yung may ari ng loop yung farmer. Ang yaman yaman nila millionaire sila pero drop out naman sila. So why would I finish my schooling? If my exemplars are, you know, didn't finish school, doesn't make sense, you know. So I'd rather learn the skill, the knowledge, of fishing, farming. Dito na lang hands-on. Wala nga lang akong degree, but you know, I'll be a responsible son later on, you know. So yon inaantok and related. And then another reason is bullying in school. Bullying is tolerated. Sometimes the teacher is the bully. I think a reader, you know, nasasirang aking record. So I think uh, you know should have looked into the bullying. Uh, so and then another reason is, kaya plan tapusin yung elementary uh, curriculum in one year sa ALS nine months graduate ka ng elementary, but ako magchachaga ng six uh, six years you know. So if DepEd can offer a compressed curriculum in nine months, hintayin ko na lang na pwede ako magals then magals na lang ako. So I think uh, we should look into that aspect you know and not to see, not to frame dropping out as something uh, you know pathological you know we should see how can we address itong decision making ng mga students natin thank you so much ma'am dr albert would you like to comment on that i, I never i never said anything about irrationality uh, I, I just said these are the facts that we got based on our interviews uh, people people make De definitely, there, there are always this, there are always drivers for why people make decisions. Some of them are supply side, some are are, are demand side. 
but the, the point that we were saying was that it's largely driven from poverty. When make, they make decisions, at least the ones that we were talking with, I, I cannot say because you know, they would be representative, but we were, we were trying to approach it from two perspectives. One was the national surveys, what do they say? And also try to probe further on what, what we were getting from, at least from the field interviews we were getting. Uh, we, did, we, didn't, we did discount the fact that there might be bullying, but we didn't get any. Uh, maybe that, that, that may be happening in certain cases. I, I know there have been some studies that suggest that, some, that the, the students are, are, are feeling bullied uh, by, by, the, by, the pair, by the teachers themselves. That may be happening, but we didn't get it. Not, not at least in the uh, field interviews we were. Uh, but we, what we were just, as I said, reporting was based on all our field interviews, trying to probe on, on what the, the kids said, what the parents said, what the teachers were saying, and also what, uh, what people from, from DepEd themselves were, were, were reporting to us. Uh, so that's it, you know. So we, we, didn't, we didn't make any, we, it's, it's kind of tough to make, to, make, to make a judgment on things that you were not told. <laughs> Uh, so we are only reporting what, what we were told. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Dan Agustin, um, aging, uh, but still working uh, in the agricultural sector of Land Bank of the Philippines. Uh, let me try to explore or let us, let us explore uh, and process the computer shop. Okay. It means a lot. Eh? Computer, technology, fire, fourth industrial, and related to curriculum. Okay. Uh, th there was a good point raised by Dr. Orbeto. Pupils, too dependent on teachers, weak as far as research is concerned, computer shop, it discourages the boys going into the school, and uh, libre on education, some economists from UP disagrees with this libre, because it, it would discourage, parang incentive now. Uh, if computer technology, uh, Dr. Alberto is an expert in the fire, uh, how do we address the computer shops to become, instead of negative, positive, para pumasok sila, that it should be within the school, say, on the hands of the faculty, as an incentive to attract these boys because we are uh, in need talaga of technology, right? And uh, in relation also to you, uh, to your analysis, maybe poverty pulls down, but where is poverty in the demographic uh, dividend? Uh, it appears that uh, your presentation, sir, is positive dividend. Thank you. Okay, so we start with uh, Dr. Abrigo. Last question, where is poverty in the in your presentation? Where is poverty in demographic dividend? Actually, um, the in demographic dividend is, is a macroeconomy uh, concept. So poverty is down down there, uh, uh, down there is uh, households. So although uh, we have done some studies uh, disaggregating national transfer accounts by income groups, and we found uh, interesting differences uh, in age profiles, economic age profiles across across uh, income groups. So, I uh, think expect that uh, uh, on average, those who are um, poor, the investment on education is actually lower. Uh, that that's on the more micro side, but but then. Uh, on the on the macro side, the man on poverty rates, we also did this study with Popcom where we find that uh, what is the potential for poverty uh, declining poverty because of this demographic dividend, and, and what we find that is quite substantial. Uh, we 
because of the demographic dividend, we will we could actually be able to decrease our poverty rate from 21 to 15 percent in just over 10 years. Okay. So uh, the first question, Dr. Albert. Uh, you know, I mean, the the fact remains. Uh, I think when we are we're, we're, when we are when we interview the parents, the not just the parents who who admit that their kids may be being drawn to the computer shops and the teachers themselves, and the, the kids themselves who admitted that. There's a clear need uh, that's being addressed by the, by the computer shops. A need by need that for the students because computers are, are savvy, whereas in the, in the classroom, what do you do? You sit down, you're asked to put your hands together, you know, and. Uh, you know, I mean, to be, quote, disciplined. In fact, most of the boys are always put, we observe, they, they're always typically put at the back you know, because they, the, the impression is the kids are, un, the, the boys are so unruly, they, they need to be disciplined. They will, and by discipline, they, you know, they, they should be put at the back. And clearly, the kids are feeling they, they, they don't, they, they lack interest uh, because the, you know, in a, in a classroom environment where you have 40, 60 students, uh, you know, and then you're trying to, you're trying to learn something from your teacher, it can be very tough. I mean, even now, listening to us <laughs> uh, for more than an hour can be already tough. C can you imagine the kids who are every day having to learn from the same sets of teachers, and sometimes perhaps the personalities may be, may be a challenge themselves trying to learn from the teachers but uh, but the point that we're, we're, we're saying is that these are these are these are telling us something no? and then in fact I told the teachers already that why I was interviewing are do you do you bother to teach ki kids how to code learning how to code you know because some of the this is something that people can learn but then kid the teachers were also saying eh, sir wala kami internet access dito so sometimes they may have the ones who have internet access are the computer shops, but not the schools. Uh, so these are these are constraints that that the schools themselves face. So how can the teacher teach something that they themselves do not know? So there might be capacity issues, but the only thing is DepEd will need to see that there's a very vastly changing environment, and unless we are able to see this and 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 this need of kids, the only thing is kasi yung need na yan, mabuti kung, ako nga, I, I was always saying, even to my own students from long ago, why, why do you use the internet? What is it for? I mean, if you're, if you're using it to really upskill, to, to learn more well and good, but then most people will use it for Facebook. Now, these days, before it was just for email, or even for selfies, you know, that's it. Uh, so, if you're if you're using it for for something very productive to gain more knowledge well and good but then i wonder how many of the kids are being taught in the computer games why don't you create your own game mm -hmm. yeah, your own app make money from it right i mean if, if we're addressing that need well and good but then i'm wondering who is the one teaching go, going to teach i think that the teachers themselves many of them may not know how to teach how to make apps how to make these things and these are some things that DepEd will need to sort of put into the, the curriculum development, if at all possible. Thank you so much. So you were raising your hands earlier. Good afternoon. My name is Henry Grajeda. I'm now affiliated with USAID, uh, but I've been involved in education reform work for uh, more than a decade. Uh, well, maybe as an ABD, <laughs> essentially a PhD dropout, <laughs> this, this comes forward as maybe a, a realization that, you know, if I had the time, I would actually do these studies myself and present comprehensive, a comprehensive set of recommendations. No? But as, an, as a practitioner, both in management as well as in uh, policy, uh, particularly in education reforms right now, my concern really is from among the list of the things that you presented, what is really actionable and what is strategic in that context? So this goes, I think, to both uh, Doc Babes and 
uh, Dr. Uh, Albert. Uh, I, I mean, in as far as the K-12 transition is concerned, which of these are really more transition issues or birthing pains, as, you, as we might call it? And which of them are really more strategic in as far as taking a look at the employability of uh, technical vocational graduates of uh, K-12? to On the other hand, for Dr. Albert, uh, since you just use logistic reg regression, I'm wondering what, what the comparator is no? for measuring yung, yung, uh, log of <laughs> log odds of dropping out versus what ba ang ang kinompare no uh, or in that within that context do you have uh, the log odds of the different factors among the long list of factors that you tested which of them seem to be uh, presenting the greatest odds of uh, contributing to the drop out decision of, of uh, uh, of, uh, oh, of a learner or a student. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Arbeta, your first question. Okay, I think the, um, the key recommendations that I would like to uh, prioritize is supporting teachers. That's basically, uh, because, the <coughs> because of procurement issues, Teachers are really, uh, that's why the, we get reactions that it's dependent, the experience of the students dependent on how good the teacher is. Even though you are a very good teacher, if you don't have support, uh, you'll eventually be uh, tired out, right? So I think uh, support resources as well as training, continuous training. Remember, this is the first, uh, we just come to the third batch of the student. They need, uh, I, I don't know what kind of uh, training they are getting, but the, uh, this is a, an entirely new ball game. Like for example, uh, as I've said, uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very much worried that the students are de-emphasizing core courses, uh, both for reasons of fourth industrial revolution. And, uh, they have to be very, they have to be trained to to acquire, uh, to be conversant with, with new technologies and all of that. And uh, it's nice that they will be know what they want in terms of profession, but core courses is what they really w need because 75% are going to college. And they can't have a sub, uh, uh, tr uh, they call it subpar training in core courses. Uh, that's one, uh, and I think because uh, that's also an offshoot of lack of resources, as well as teachers not being tra trained well and not supported well. Uh, so they are being taught junior high school level uh, core courses, which should never be, because that's, uh, that's one, it disinterests the students. Two, it's long, over long term, that's a very costly uh, item. So we need a lot of support for the teachers to perform the jobs of teaching. That, that's one. And, uh, the other thing that I, I'd like to, uh, for the employment side, which is the, of, of the study, is really on, on, on uh, the TVL training, I think one of the things that probably there is lack of, lack of, of laboratories, basically. So that's, that's, that's a very key issue. Uh, and I'm, I'm very, I don't know, I'm, that's why I'm not, don't like to mention this, but the laboratories has been transferred to free tuition. <laughs> laboratories money has transferred to free tuition. That, Pains my heart. So basically, the in for for college. So uh, that's that's the uh, uh, we didn't. Uh, if we, if you want at least twenty five percent of the students going towards work, they should be trained well. Uh, they should have the laboratories. And of course, I don't know. Uh, maybe the teachers as well. Uh, that that has to be. So those are uh, delivering the basic promises of the, of the program uh, requires continuous training because as, uh, as I've said, there, you don't know what you are facing. The teachers don't know what they are facing. With, so teachers for uh, training for core courses, TVL laboratories, teachers training also for them. And basically, I think that's the key here. So continuous training and really digging deep into uh, or preparing them into uh, uh, teaching the students uh, for core courses at the college level 
and TVL at really at the, uh, the, the level of TVIs, for instance. That, uh, that so basically those are the things that has to be uh, delivering those, those, uh, those basic uh, promises of the program is key. Uh, and we have to train our guns on that and 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 uh, uh, improve that until we sh we we, we uh, achieve mastery and i don't, i don't even want to think about other things that uh, besides that uh, as i have said even if how good the teacher is they, they are, i think the the life of the senior high school program up to now is on the teacher uh, the teacher that's good or form well but uh, without continuous support, without continuous training, the teacher will fail. Uh, on average, because you know, there are only a few teachers who are going to be good. So to raising all the teachers to the level of, of delivering the basic promises of the program is a very, uh, is a, is a very is a key priority for the program. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. Albert? Uh, during the first out-of-school children's study we did, how many years ago? Seven years ago. We, uh, we gave them we gave them a, a whole list of actionable agenda, which, and I am glad to say that ma, ma, many of that actually has, has been addressed, but we, we were just pointing out that there were a few things that they missed out on and, and continue to miss out on. But now there, are, there seem to be a, a, a changing landscape. Uh, and so what, con, in actually uh, consonance with what Babes was saying, Supporting the teachers as far as what? I, we mentioned work, teacher workload. I mean, it's just too much. I mean, that's, that in itself is already actionable. Uh, uh, why are we giving them, why are we overburdening them rather than making sure that they, what they're, they're supposed to be doing, which is teaching? And, and yet we're, we're, doing, we're, we're giving them so many things and, and again, supporting also what Babes was saying about essentially trying to ensure that we have back to basics because we, we tend to be focusing on so many things like I, I, I can go back even to the, the different strands when you look at the current uh, uh, in, in senior high uh, you look at you see the curriculum research across all even in sports there's research why will you have re research in sports I mean uh, can't you can't you devise a program that will really be because if it's basics, it will be something that will be something that will be useful really for the kids when, when they get out of high school. And I think that's one of the reasons why they feel somehow that there's a disconnect between work. If, they're, if they come up from a fishing, fishing community, they, what, is, what is the use of this? Why will I use this? Where was, what will it be for? It's, if the teacher cannot basically explain to kids what, what, they're, what they're teaching, is for then basically you lose them you will you will, you know i mean i always think of if you think of an organization the leader being being able to how do you say this to be able to uh inspire people i am unsure right now to what extent our educational system is inspiring students to become the best that they can be and because of that somehow you it it goes back to when I say back to basics, reading, reading is of the very start. If, if we're failing on the reading and, and we're seeing this specifically from the performance metrics, that's already telling us what we should be doing, but yet it seems like we're, we're, we, we have this inertia. We, uh, we're, we're adre we, we have uh, difficulty addressing what is already staring us in the face. Um, Third issue uh, from teacher workload to back to basics is this issue of inequalities, which are, are they can get various forms from, as I mentioned, from the, the re regional inequalities in outcomes to something as very basic as gender equality. If there, if you are lo if you are seeing disparities in in gender outcomes in education. I'm getting more and more concerned, and we, we continue to sort of think that this is something that we can just uh, have business as usual. We need to start making the changes. Uh, small things I, we already mentioned, they're actionable. In fact, most of, most of the things we already mentioned were actionable from years ago, but until now, 
I'm not sure if they're, they're falling on deaf ears or maybe nobody is you know, taking it on uh, as, uh, within, the, within the department itself or uh, stakeholders. No? Uh, small things that can help make sure that every child gets not just access to, to school, but quality education. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Dr. Orbeta, would you like just to Just a quick uh, no, I think I just remember that one of the things that the, both the teachers and the students that we, for the subsequent, this is the second uh, of the to 12 uh, senior high school studies that we've been doing, complaining is that the, the curriculum is over ambitious. And basically that's both from the students so that means that they are overloaded, both the teachers and the students. It does their, uh, uh, they express that, that, that feeling. Uh, it's, pa it's packed with too many things, both from the student side and from the teacher side. Uh, thank you, Dr. Orbeta. Uh, sir, your second question was about the analysis, regression analysis of Dr. Albert. Yeah, well, a, a logit regression will always assume, you know, you're ba basically comparing two sets of groups. And the, here you're comparing s those kids who are not in school as against those kids who are in school. And basically, the only thing with, with any regression is you're always going to assume that your covariates are, um, you know, are, are, are independent. And, and that can be a, a, a pose, a, a bit of a problem because in a way, you're... you're uh, I, I already mentioned that there are certain interlocking uh, issues. Uh, even if you're, you're a, a, a poor, you know, if you're if you're a poor family, then of course uh, there's a very strong likelihood that your the, the mother will be from a low education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So those kinds of things uh, we did that control for when you did the econometric uh, analysis. But these are things that preferably will be will be explained in a regression. But if they're not, then you have to account for them. But but if you if you try to account for them, unfortunately, it your model may become too too difficult to explain. <laughs> so, and you know, these are one of the things that that uh, that sort of you, you're stuck with when you're uh, when you're doing econometric models. Do you explain with a model that can be understood as against a more complex model that tries to address things, but at the end of the day, uh, you have difficulty explaining. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Albert. Another, another question from the audience, please. Okay, sir. After, after him, sir. Good afternoon. I'm JC Punong Bayan from UP and Rappler. So I have uh, questions for all three uh, fellows. So for Dr. Ar Orbeta, um, it seems to me that uh, it's important when, it, when we're talking about the senior high program, um, we have to have we have we have to have a good idea of how students trans transition from junior high school, senior high school, and then well after high school whether they go to college or work. But uh, would you be aware of uh, any study um, being conducted right now, whether by the DEPED or any other organization, about um, the transitions uh, that I mentioned? And um, I, I'm just wondering whether um, DEPED is paying enough attention to this uh, insofar as uh, we're already entering the third year of implementation of senior high and uh, there doesn't seem to have uh, there, there doesn't seem to be any uh, substantial research uh, on this uh, matter yet for dr. Albert um, uh, the um, gender gap in achievement uh, that's something we've known for a long time now um, but I was just wondering um, how other countries cope with that kind of uh, gap how they try to cross that gap and uh, what insights can we draw from other countries and so that we can apply them here in our country and then for Dr. Abrigo, um, uh, you mentioned that uh, there are um, financial implications of uh, um, age, an aging uh, Philippines. Uh, I was just wondering because there are pressures right now for a universal social pension. And um, I'm sure that that will involve um, a substantial sum of money as well. But I'm just wondering whether that's fe at all feasible or uh, will ju that um, uh, put us on an unsustainable uh, financial track uh, in the coming decades. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We'll start with Dr. Abrigo. <laughs> Social pension. Well, f first thing, well, Dr. Albert did 
so a, a lot of studies on social pension, but baka sasagot din siya. But for me, uh, well, social pension is a good thing because it, it's not just free money. It's 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 a social safety net, diba? Now, and, and these people, it's not uh, necessarily a donut because these people have been deprived all, the, all their lifetime. So it's actually some way of the government giving them something now, th 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 to tie them over. And how are you going to 500? You cannot live on 500 a month. But, but that having said that, uh, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if something that we as a society decided on, that we will provide for the people that's in need, then still someone has to pay. And somehow, somewhere, may pitaka lalabas magbabayad dyan. And one way to finance this uh, social pension is that eventually, sana, wala nang tayong bibigyan ng social pension because everyone is able to, to learn, study, have work, and eventually, we will be able to face out uh, these kinds of, uh, of uh, allergies. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Abrigo. Dr. Albert, please. Uh, actually, all of the things that we, we suggested to DepEd from the, you know, the, the differentiated learning, uh, that, that's actually been used in other countries. No? Uh, you, you know that boys and girls learn differently, so you, you, you should be really making sure that your school environments are adopting. Unfortunately, that's the, the problem. No? When you are, you're, you're faced with trying to, to work with needs of different kids if you have so many kids in the in the classroom so there, there's a tendency for the teacher to to adopt a, a single strategy for all no or at least for the average person who average learner whoever he or she may be and then in the process you you may the advanced learners become bored the 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 the, the challenge students become left behind you know um, but these are things that 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 the teachers themselves have to, to start re recognizing that boys have, have different set of skills and, and, and interests. And, and particularly as the case for the CCT that we were suggesting that preferably that, you know, that the boys be given extra cash transfers than the, the girls. In Mexico, that's been the reverse that the, the girls were the ones who were not go going to school. That's why they actually gave higher cash transfers, and it worked. Uh, and that's, in fact, the, the model that we were sort of suggesting. Why can't, if they, they did it in Mexico, but it, they supported the girls, why can't we do something like this? Because we have a, a reverse thing here happening. And then even for the uh, uh, hiring more of male teachers, that's been done in Australia, particularly uh, giving uh, scholarships for males to actually get into education and eventually get into teaching professions. No? So all of these things that we suggested came from international best practices, but we were, and as I said, we have been echoing this for years now, <laughs> and I don't know why, why up to now it's, um, no action has been taken, I, so I cannot speak for DepEd nor, nor its stakeholders. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Albert. Dr. Orbeta? Thank you. Uh, actually, that uh, issue is being, uh, 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 I think, the uh, both formally and informally being studied. Uh, the, the first uh, uh, informal study was really on transition from uh, junior high school to senior high school and uh, from the, be in the beginning. And I think the uh, DepEd was surprised and uh, that they have, uh, they were expecting only the, the, uh, 1 million students, but they got 1.2 million. So th when they were looking at the data, and, uh, that's the informal study, uh, the looking at the data, they said that the, uh, from their interviews, it's really, uh, students who are out of school coming back because it's free. So that's basically that's 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 the the uh, one side of the so currently I I, I was looking for chat. <laughs> uh, she's there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think she's she, they will they are doing a study on this especially particularly on, on uh, 
how uh, like students moving from pub public to private in vis a vis the idea of I don't know if I'm right with the interpretation chat of the uh, vouchers and the educational service contracting, the movement of students from uh, pu pu public to private, and, and there's a claim that there's a movement back. So uh, I think this, that's now a formal study that I think that Chat uh, and, and company are doing. Is that am I correct? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so that's that's uh, I, I, I think Chat will have uh, the floor, the, but maybe that's what time to finish. But I'm. On what I'm, I'm more interested in is the transition to, to employment of senior high school, but we are still awaiting data. I hope we can get data on uh, uh, our, uh, so that it not be an anecdotal on, from let's say, or LFS, or uh, on, on uh, how much of the students, uh, senior high school students actually work after. after. So uh, I hope we can, uh, as, I, as I said, we were making representations from uh, PSA, where that they should disaggregate whether if they go to college, the where did they go, public or private, or if they go to employment and all that. So th those are kind of the data set that we are waiting for, 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 for the transition to employment. Yes, chat I will. college students in school year 2018-19. Uh, that's one million. And I saw from your numbers, the graduates is 1.2. So this really confirms your point that about 83%, actually I computed it earlier, 83% are going to college, which is amazing. When we were about to launch, or DepEd, hindi naman we, senior high school, uh, at that time they were talking of uh, transition to college at around 50% at best. Now it's 83%. Yeah, so even the TVL, to your point earlier, I just want to add. Thank you so much, uh, Mom Chat, for s sharing that information. Yes, sir? Follow-up question? I, I think we, we could pay attention to the incentives to, to training up. Eh? Uh, and I've mentioned it this a uh, number of times with Doc Chat and maybe at some in the last Human Capital Forum of the World Bank, that if you check the occupational wage surveys, and take a look at the this uh, of the nine occupation types and just take a look at uh, number three which are the associate professionals and technicians and compare their wages average wages with the unskilled or level level nine uh, there's hardly any difference and in some industries they're actually paid less than the unskilled workers. So uh, what, what is clear is the wage premiums of the college graduates are much clearer, much better, much higher in many multiples of the. So you, you really have that, that incentive to go for higher education if your wage rates are, are that skew or distorted. No? So for technicians, and, and this is where I bring up the Philippine Qualifications Framework, there's hardly any definition of what distinguishes an NC1, NC2, which you can get in senior high school, and NC3, NC4, NC5, but you can get the distinction now with NC6, which is, oh no, not NC, it's level six in PQF, which is already your bachelor's degree. So the differentiation where, uh, differentiation of wages according to skills is not that clear at the uh, medium level, which is where the senior high school and the college undergraduate dropouts uh, belong to. But if you, and, and then you try to triangulate, for instance, uh, with the labor force, 40% uh, of the labor force never finished basic education but only 26% cla are classified as 
unskilled or elementary workers. Meaning that at some point they acquire a skill that they contribute into the economy. But whether that skill is paid for has a premium over the unskilled, we don't know yet. So these things, I think, can be part of the future <laughs> efforts to understand what is it that will incentivize skilling up, what is it that will trigger productivity gains that will result in demographic, demographic dividends. Uh, as long as we continue to sort of not look at those factors, then we will end up with the same recommendation, supply-side interventions. Thank you for pointing that out, sir. Would, uh, the, would our speakers like to comment on that? I'd just like to, uh, uh, I think I've shown uh, in one of the graphs that uh, uh, technical vocational graduates are paid higher than college undergraduates. So that's uh, on average based on the labor force wages. So that's, I, I compare that. So basically, it, uh, that's one of the aberrations in the, in the rela uh, relative wages across, uh, across education uh, uh, levels. So if you are a graduate of technical vocational education, you're paid higher than a college undergraduate. Of course, the college graduate is high paid higher, so that's, that's the only, uh, like, goes up from elementary, uh, no education, elementary, uh, high school, but that one, uh, then the lower down for Alice undergraduates and higher up for uh, technical vocational uh, graduate, not undergraduate, so essentially. That's, that's the thing, to just to confirm your point. Thank you so much. Sir, Doc, uh, Mr. Agustin, a follow-up question, please. Using uh, the framework of uh, socialist countries like China. China, they have the so-called central planning. For example, human development is tied up with economic development, industrialization, like that. So these are all sinks, uh, sink, in other words. Is our human capital development plan linked, say, with manufacturing, with uh, the entire economic development plan? Would, would you like to answer that question, sir? Any one of them? Doctor, Mr. Agustin? Link or in sync with the planning? Yes. Dr. Orbeta? Uh, uh, one of the things that I, I, I have a personal opinion on is, is that uh, I, I don't really like uh, human capital planning. Uh, I, I, look, I work more on incentives, like for example. Uh, one of the things that you find here, uh, for a long while we have been saying that why are students not pursuing STEM? Or why are our scientists leaving? Then I was looking at relative wages of, of uh, different graduates. And you know that STEM is one of the lowest paid college graduates in the country. So, that's, so basically it's the level of humanities and all of that. And, 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 and uh, so on the average, uh, I was, uh, that's why people don't take on. So I think the, the better way of, oh, that's why I, I don't, I don't subscribe to planning because you don't really know what's the future. I always said that uh, uh, the only thing that will prepare you to an uncertain future is a very good core uh, skills, which can be shaped by uh, industrial experience or personal experience into many things that you would like to pursue. So that's, that's so. So like, uh, I just, uh, I just likened it. Pro uh, like, you may be a proficient programmer in Fortran, but what's Fortran now? So basically, so so the the, the core core the core the core uh, competence is programming, not the language. So essentially, so that's that's essentially the uh, uh, my own. Uh, so 
one of the things that people have been asking, are we, are we, uh, are we overproducing college graduates? That's one. So um, my only uh, question is that, uh, my only answer to that is that, I don't know the answer, but you see, when you compute the ret rates of returns of college graduates, it's still very high. That means you still pay to get college education. So that's, 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 that's uh, I don't know how many college graduates do we need. Actually, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no number. Uh, but what we are finding out that the more technology is progressing, the more college graduates are being paid higher. But unfortunately for the country, our STEM graduates are not being paid well. That means that our industrial structure is not valuing STEM graduates that much. That's my interpretation. Whether it's correct or not, it's a revelation of data. Uh, I would like them to be paid more so that they will stay here. But fortunately, the labor market doesn't pay them. That means our industrial structure doesn't value them that much. That's, that's essentially the, uh, the, my interpretation. But just the same, I still don't have an answer to your question. Just, just my opinion. Thank you so much, Dr. Urbeta. Uh, another question from the audience, please. Okay. All right. So, wala na po ba kayong mga katanungan? Oh, okay, sir. Okay, uh, Dr. Abrigo, please. Uh, you introduced a very good concept, Gener generational equity, balance the cost. Uh, that is what's your con conclusion. Can you expound further? And if we have to take to balance the cost in our demographic dividend, which agency in government should manage this? And what are our targets? Thank you very much. Dr. Er, Dr. Abrigo. Ang hirap naman ng tanong niya. <laughs> well, generational equity is, just, is this idea na essentially whatever these people at this age is getting right now, this will be the same benefits that we will have when our time comes. And right now, we're giving a lot. And well, I can say it's a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's just that we're benefiting from it. But then eventually, pag konti na lang yung magbabayad ng taxes natin, pag 40% na lang yung nagtatrabaho, kasi yung iba, 20% na yung matatanda natin, yung iba mga bata, will they be able to still pay to fund us pag tayo na? Baka eventually, ngayon ang, ang generous natin sa universal healthcare, sa pension, pag tayo na, ngay ngayon ay nagbayad para sa kanila, baka wala na magbabayad sa atin. At kung sino magbabayad na, hindi ko alam. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, Bob. But Towards defined, mga ba yun, babes? Defined benefit or nakalimutan ko na, basta yun. <laughs> Either defined benefit or defined contribution. Di ba? Change your pension system instead na pay go. Defined contribution sa. Actually, uh, maraming mga bansa, ganun ang ginagawa. Even for their health care. Uh, because right now, ang ginagawa natin for the pension system, even for the, for the social health insurance, is that it's from one pocket to another. At pag nilipat mong ganun, wala namang extra value dun. Na binayaran mo lang siya. But when you course it through some incentive system na kailangan eh, i-save mo siya para eventually, pag kailangan mo, meron ka mahuhugot. And that leads to some dividend kasi yung pera na sinave mo eventually is used by someone in the economy that produces something. So productivity increases. Also, it somehow corrects yung incentives na kasi alam mo na ikaw magbabayad ng healthcare mo eventually, aalagaan mo yung sarili mo. Unlike right now na bahala ka, na may, someone else will pay for it. Uh, yes, Dr. Arbeta. I think uh, what I'm worried about is that it's very difficult to withdraw a benefit once it's granted. Uh, there will be trouble. 
uh, try to withdraw a certain so that basically we should be very sparing in terms of giving uh, on declaring benefits unfunded benefits you uh, should say uh, that's why most countries are moving towards defined contribution meaning you 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 build your own pension plan whatever you want you want a very rich old age you save a lot now and and don't uh, so that's that's what most people are are uh, most countries are doing because they don't know the future people are living longer you don't know what kind of life you want when you're old so you save up for it don't depend on other people but we are going the reverse way we are going a lot of going giving a lot of benefits without thinking of where the money will be coming from. And we have troubles even collecting our taxes. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a double whammy. Uh, uh, it could have been better if you have a better collection system, but as, as we have, as we already know, we have a problem. And we're giving a lot of freebies. Now we don't really know where the benefits. The only thing that is actually clear is the sin taxes, supposedly. <laughs> But how far can you go in that? And, and, uh, and, but uh, hindi lang health ang binabayaran natin. Para education, uh, ni, uh, free irrigation, free... Sabi ko nga, why don't we ask for free food? <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question from one of our viewers. Uh, she's Miss Mercedes Arzadon. And this is for Dr. Or Orbeta. The 80-hour training is not enough. Thus, employers think it's of low quality. So, should this be increased by DepEd? Sir, your comment on this, please. Uh, actually, uh, the, it's, it has to be no ones. Cause some of the, what the, I think, what do we interpret the comments of this? Some of the skills requires more than 80 hours. So, indeed, dapat yung one. I don't, I don't know how to implement this. It's a nightmare implementation in terms of, and how whether it should be within the key to 12 or which. Uh, or part of the already the uh, in-service training uh, of, of the firm. We, we don't know that uh, because I don't know how to implement, like for example, if you, which one would you, uh, a, a very hard decisions have to be made in terms of how do you allocate the fixed number of hours the students are in school. Uh, so if, if you increase the, uh, the uh, work immersion, what would you cut? Uh, yeah, it's also, you have to cut something else. See, you know, no, you know, a proportioning, no, no. And we know already that uh, some of the skills require more than 80 hours. You uh, know, reclamo ng mga firms. But whether it should be done within the, the senior high school uh, system or as part of the pre service training, uh, uh, pre uh, what call this employment training, uh, it has to be decided. Yeah, thank you so day. much, sir. So that concludes our uh, seminar this afternoon and would like to thank our speakers for their insights. And of course, our audience for their active participation. But before we let you go, may we request you to please fill up the, the evaluation form and uh, give it to our secretariat. Uh, once again, we would like to thank you for coming and see you again in our next um, activities. Thank you.